The year is 1987, and American TV networks launch a number of short-lived shows, such as Starman, The Popcorn Kid, and Probe. In a fit of midlife nostalgia and an effort to remind the world of shows they have forgotten, lone podcast pilot Chris Cooling steps into the forgotten TV studio 30 years later. Remembered to obscure TV memories of the 70s and 80s, including short lived TV shows and made for TV movies, this is Forgotten TV. Welcome to Forgotten TV, the podcast that brings you TV memories of the 70s and 80s. I am your host, Chris Cooling. This is part three of Forgotten TV's consideration of the 1983 CBS TV series, WizKids. Part one related the previously untold origins of the show, how concepts by both writer-producers Bob Shane and Phil Daguerre were combined into the show we eventually saw aired, and featured a breakdown of each episode, including some behind-the-scenes details relevant to each one. In part two, I dug deep behind the scenes of the overall series, looked at the actors, the production, and critical reception of the show, technical details, locations, and we heard from creator-producer Bob Shane in the interview segment. In this final episode of the WizKids Trilogy, we'll hear directly from the WizKid actors. In the multiple-month production and research effort that went into this, I reached out to all the primary actors and producers. Bob Shane facilitated contact with Andrea Elson, who was receptive to sharing her memories of the show. I was then able to contact Madeline Kane, who played Richie's mom on the show. She encouraged me to reach out to Linda Scruggs, who, while we didn't get an interview, I had a great conversation with, which added details to the podcasts. A follow-up contact to Todd Porter gained a response, and it turned out he had been trying to respond to me by email for months, which were eaten by the email demons, but we finally made contact. He then referred me to Adrienne Daguerre, daughter of show creator Phil Daguerre, an actress on the show. Adrian and Todd added details that allowed me to further refine and clarify information that made it into the Behind the Scenes podcast. In the times we've entered, your support of Forgotten TV is more important than ever. Stay tuned at the end for ways to support the show, as well as a look at what's planned this year for Forgotten TV. So now, sit back and enjoy these four conversations with the WizKids family, presented in the order in which they occurred. The WizKids stars speak on this episode of Forgotten TV. Well, today on Forgotten TV, we have a special guest. She trained as a classical actress, was in a hundred TV commercials, and appeared in guest roles on shows like The Six Million Dollar Man, Quincy, and TJ Hooker, before being cast as Irene Adler, mother to computer genius Richie, on 1983's Whiz Kids. Please welcome to Forgotten TV, Madeline Kane. Well, hi there. I'm so glad that... Uh, we were able to get you uh, on the show today to talk about WizKids. I'm, I'm happy to go down memory lane. It's a happy memory. <laughs> Excellent. Well, why don't we start with telling us uh, how you came to be involved with that production, how you, how you were cast or got the role of, of uh, being Irene Adler on WizKids. 
Well, I had a good friend at the time, Barbara Brownell, another actress, uh, who was um, was going up for the show. And um, after her audition, she said, I was a blonde. They don't want a blonde. They're looking for a brunette. And she, Barbara happened to know the wife of Phil DeGare, the producer, and she was nice enough to call Linda and say, you know, you should bring her in. And so I was indeed brought in because uh, an actress friend was kind enough to <laughs> um, work as my agent in that. And, and I got it miraculously. And Barbara happily was on uh, a couple episodes as well playing a neighbor. Well, at, were you aware at the time of the the origin of the character name of Irene Adler, the, the Sherlockian origin of that. I did not know it until we were in production, and then they uh, filled me in on that. And I thought it was such a charming, uh, and, and so true of how so many things happen, you know, that they're, they're uh, tied to the person who's writing it or who's composing or who had a best friend of that name. So, yes, I, it was it, the Sherlock Holmes uh, character. Irene Adler, I liked it. <laughs> of course, that came. That was a result of of Bob Shane's involvement. You can right. clearly see his fingerprints right. He was on that. he was the one who was the big fan of Sherlock mm-hmm. Holmes. And I didn't realize it at the time either, being the the, the same age as the characters on the show. Um, mm. How that uh, the the origin of that character name until I was an adult and and came across that uh, it uh, came from Sherlock Holmes and you know yeah. she's that yeah. character is in modern interpretation she's become sort of an arch enemy or sometimes lover uh, of Holmes and uh, of, you know she only appeared in one of the stories but uh, well anyway. in this case, in this case she was just mom <laughs> good old mom so the other person that was involved in the the production the executive producer was was mr phil de guerre and yes. uh, of course he was already running uh his show simon and simon at the time yes, do you he have was. any mm-hmm. have any thoughts or memories about uh, working with him oh absolutely phil was a really creative bright energized man and um he had a special passion about whiz kids I think because he himself was kind of a whiz kid and liked computers and um, and and he at one point when the show was on the air he said I have the number one show in the nation which was Simon and Simon and he said and I have the best show that's on television and that's Whiz Kids so he really had a devotion to it he he uh, produced a crossover segment that Simon and Simon did with Whiz Kids and I think Phil did all that he could to uh get the show out there and get it the attention that he felt it deserved. He certainly knew uh, for the time quite a bit about technology. Oh. Um I found yes. a 1984 yes. uh article in PC Magazine where they interviewed him and ah. it was clear he was heavily involved in using uh, equipment in the office and knew more than the average person about uh, what were new products at the time. I, I think it was he really did open a window into, he understood that children would be the ones who would latch on to computers and be able to see the um, the possibilities that those computers created for for them and and that's what was kind of fun the the kids in the show they're not kids anymore but at the time they were kids brought such a wonderful energy to the set um and they were excited about the computers and now when i think of it those are the original of uh, not the original original but the the first pcs that most of us saw that had those green flashing dots and everything and the kids loved it Yes, there were some old school microcomputers uh, depicted on the show. Um, mm-hmm. the, the Farley character had one of the earliest versions of a laptop, uh, the Gavilan wow. computer, and they heavily depicted how it worked. And there was a lot of a lot of glory shots of the the actual devices being used. <laughs> um, I, I 
I wonder how much of that was uh, some product placement going on with uh, the various computer companies that are they're credited I, at, at the that's end. That's a very interesting. That's a very interesting theory. I wouldn't be one bit surprised if that happened. Of course, none of us were aware of that at the time. And Phil was a great user, uh, somewhat early user of, of TV crossovers. Uh, he did that to launch the second season of Simon and Simon, with uh, mm-hmm. it crossing over with Magnum PI, which which launched that second season of his show to to be a hit status which was not the case in the first season and then you know the ver- the third episode of whiz kids there we are crossing over we have a two-night event um yeah whiz kids one night simon and simon the next and, and you got to you got to be uh on simon and simon with jameson parker i did i got to and and i also um when whiz kids unfortunately ended um they shot a, a simon and simon simone simone in Paris, and I got to play uh, a different character, not Irene Adler, and we shot in Paris, and um, that was a, a really uh, that was a fun event, being able to be in Paris and have uh, and and have the opportunity to have a three hour lunch in the middle of the day with wine. <laughs> ah, yeah, two part. Yeah, the launched season four with that with a two part episode with you. Uh huh. Uh huh. Was great. It was just great. So on WizKids, do you have any uh, episodes that stick out in memory? Uh, I know there were a couple that, uh, that had more well, featured the, your character the than one that I, The one that was the most fun for me was the one with Marjo Goitner, um, because I knew who he was, and the kids certainly didn't and didn't know his history. And he was such a, um, a presence on the set and such... Um, of a force. I mean, you could feel who this special man was, and it was, it was just terrific to be around him. He was as um, dedicated as any actor I'd ever met, and was humble and um, just as professional as you could possibly be. So that was fun. The other episode, and I don't know the name of it now, but there was a, a, a mad. Um, scramble in a water theme park and yes. they wanted my character to go down the water slide at the end and i was terrified of it absolutely terrified so they had to get a stunt double <laughs> to come in i was completely embarrassed about that but i i really just couldn't overcome the fear so those are those are things that I remember that were a lot of fun. The wrong Mr. Wright, where Richie signed. That's it. Irene the wrong for, Mr. Wright. Yes. Signed you up for a dating service behind your back. Yes, yeah. as a child would do. Now, now, how prescient is that as well? Dating services. Yeah, we had uh, for a brief time uh, in the nineteen eighties. Uh, the use of home video cameras made possible the video dating, where they had uh, uh-huh. people would make video cassettes. And uh, a service was involved, and there was uh, they would uh, they would pair people, and and you'd get uh, you'd get potential matches, and and now who doesn't use any of these services? I mean, you're on that's our phone. That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You know your business about your dating stuff. <laughs> that was the the beginning of all that kind of stuff. And now it's evolved. What did you think about? Uh, do you remember the the offbeat? episode mm. uh, where the Egyptian mummy curse, Amen to Amen Ray, um, where the characters got to play the opposite of, of their normal lives. Oh my goodness, yes, what fun, what fun. And, and, and these kids, by the way, were such fantastic actors. They were, it was, unca- you know, I'd worked with a lot of kids, but, but aside from Melanie, who was the little one, the little girl, these were all teenagers, and they were so gifted, and and each was so unique. Each was so, such a special character in in their own right, and and uh, and I I wonder how many of them have gone on to stay in the business. I know little Melanie, the the, the little toddler, was so fascinated in camera work that the cameraman would put her on his lap while they were shooting scenes that she wasn't in so that she could learn how to how things worked. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah, she went on to, to be in several movies and, and other TV shows. Oh, good. She was in The Wonder Years and uh, Growing Pains, so she had a, a little bit of uh, additional work after WizKids. 
You know, some I have seen some children who have um, stage mothers, and uh, particularly in the case of of little Melanie, she did not have a stage mother. This was a kid who wanted to be in show business. <laughs> she really did. It was sweet. So I know. And Matt, what about the boys? How are yes. the boys? Does anybody know where they are and what they're doing? Well, I know uh, Andrea's done very nicely, and I hear she's married and has two children now. And she has uh, uh, developed a career in teaching yoga, so she has her oh, own yoga studio. Oh, good for her. Um, and the others went in different fields. Uh, 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 Jeffrey was Jeffrey is a lawyer in the LA area. <gasps> wow. <laughs> and uh, 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 Todd went uh, back to uh, his home state and uh, resumed private life. He, he went out of the business and uh, uh-huh, studied, studied uh-huh. business at college and, and uh, has, uh, has a position there in, in his home state. And on set, I know that at the time, Matthew was a video game champion. Um, I don't know uh, if he was uh, enthusiastic about that or if that was anything that ever came up on set with, uh, with his interests. Um, you know, not with me, but I'm sure it did with the other kids I, because they would all play, you know, with themselves. Mm-hmm. Matthew's a very bright young man, you know, and a very interesting uh, brain. So that would make perfect sense that he would be into video games. Yeah, and today he's, he's still in the industry. He does behind the scenes uh, vo- a lot of voiceover work. Um, Good. And, uh, and behind the camera stuff. And there was one episode where uh, Matthew and Jeffrey actually uh, did breakdancing on camera. Did, uh, I don't know if you were on set when that happened. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Oh, my goodness. That, Isn't that something? That was shot at the school. Uh, and we know oh, that, yeah. Uh, was it shot at the Canyon High School? And uh, uh-huh. they, they filmed uh, a lot of the scenes there in the computer lab and, and, and exterior shots. Um, but they were actually did some breakdancing in one episode. I was surprised. Oh, my God. That, Isn't that, that scene something? Yeah. actually is deleted from the syndication runs. And you have to have uh, one of the original recordings to, to have that scene. Um, and, Why is it deleted, do you think? Well, in, uh, when they, they reran the show for a lot of markets, they would cut off uh, three or four minutes uh, for airtime for additional commercials. Oh, and I see. That's oft, often TV shows are the victim of that in rerun syndication. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and it doesn't true. advance the plot, so you don't right. need it exactly. per se. Yeah, makes sense. So, with them being underage, what the with the the shorter shooting days? What? How did they arrange that? Did you have to shoot at different times if you weren't in the same scene, or how, how was that? Well, uh, they. You know, the kids have to do schooling. They have a set number of hours that they have to be in school. And so the, um, the teacher uh, was, was there. And it was rare that all the kids were in a scene together. It happened, but it wasn't always, you know, going on. So, so oftentimes one or two kids would be in school and another scene would be shot. It did not... Uh, it, I must say, and to Phil DeGuerre's credit, and Bob Shane, too, that worked masterfully well. They really were able to coordinate um, all of those school times and the scene times. And the kids, because they were young, had so much energy that, you know, they were able to bounce from one to the other. They were terrific that way. And not only did you get to work with the kids, uh, you got to work mm-hmm. with Max Gale. It was just just off of him yes. coming off of uh, Barney Miller. Um, uh, yes, and and he was a, such a sweetheart. What a nice man Max is. Yeah. And uh, A. Martinez, uh, pre Santa Barbara fame. Yes, yes, A. Martinez, who's done very well. He's a and a, a, another another seasoned pro, a very talented actor. So, uh, do you recall that uh, during? production uh, about halfway through producers on set changed we went from bob shane running the shows to uh, other people coming on like james crocker who was writing and producing Mm -hmm. and joe gannon um do you i don't know if you recall much of that or uh or have any i don't actually because because those of us down working on on the soundstage were more used to the directors which would Mm -hmm. you know turn around and but we had the same crew all the time. We didn't because we weren't in direct contact with the head office. 
we didn't see them all that much. So it didn't affect us on a day-to-day basis. Okay. And you got to work with some great directors. Uh, Corey Allen did the first three episodes, which you had mentioned yes. to me. Yes. Um, Corey was terrific, and, and, and we had a very nice rapport, and, and he was terrific. He was great. He's done we had great lighting people, too, I, I have to say. I don't know who, who they were, but they were sensational. And that comes across particularly good. in the, uh, the French DVD set, um, which w- oh. <laughs> has many of the episodes that they, about uh, 10 of them have uh, better video quality, um, much uh-huh. miles ahead of what's, uh, what you find on YouTube with the third generation d- uh, yeah. home recording and all of that. And, and WizKids had very limited reruns in the U.S. Um, yeah, very limited. Just yeah. a couple of years. We, you know, we we the unfortunate thing about WizKids, and you know, looking back over it, and and there were, a, I know Phil was frustrated. We got on air. We got a nice time slot, but then the World Series came in. So I think we around our third or fourth episode that was aired. We got bumped off because of the World Series, and then we're bumped off again. And then they moved us to a different time slot. And and he was frustrated because he felt we couldn't capture an audience that you know we because at the beginning you have to kind of bring people in and, and hope that they follow you. And it was so erratic where we were and when we were on. It was difficult to follow because. He felt it was such a superior show, but um, I, I guess that's the fates. You know, that's what happens sometimes. Yeah, that's the very thing he was worried about, was competing against uh-huh. World Series. And uh, CBS would only bump it uh, a week. Um, and then the second episode got uh, preempted anyway, because they didn't want to go against uh, Game 5 or whatever it was at the time. Yeah, yeah, And uh, yeah. The, the, sh- the air dates shifted on uh, yeah. on down the line, and it got preempted for our holiday specials, and then they moved it to Saturday, yeah. and um, even yeah. on the original night, uh, probably a lot of the potential audience was already watching the Fall Guy. Yeah, the, oh, I mean, the Fall it, you're, Guy. You're attempt- oh my God, I've forgotten that show. Yeah, you, know, you <laughs> want the eleven and twelve year olds to watch this show, and you know Fall Guy's on, so right. uh, it's uh, it, it had a, kind of an uphill battle. Uh, from, it did from the beginning. Yeah. But uh, just just very very limited reruns here. But uh, uh, in uh, other markets, it, it, it ran worldwide. I don't know if, if you were aware how extensive uh, no. the show was rerun worldwide. Um, not only, of course, in France, they ran it in 1984 and again in 1995, but it uh, ran in Japan, huh. uh, ran in Mexico. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> New Zealand, Australia, uh, Uruguay. Those are the ones that I found, uh, of course, in, in the U.K., obviously. I mean, they U.K. seemed to put on everything uh, that uh, the United States aired, even before the original was not even finished airing. Uh, it was uh, on ITV in the U.K., so it, it had a, extensive true? reruns yeah. worldwide, and I don't know if you ever get recognized from it or uh, mm. anybody ever asks I, you about WizKids. I, I, at the time, at the time, I would uh, occasionally, but um, but not subsequently, no, no. But it was fun. It was fun to be in the deli and someone say, are you the lady? <laughs> <laughs> say, yeah, I'm the lady. I'm that lady. <laughs> Did it was you... so much fun to do. It does. It sounds like it was uh, from from all uh, accounts so far um, that uh, that I've collected um, there. You know, and I'm, I'm speaking to uh, uh, Tammy Taylor and others that uh, guest acted uh, uh, Robbie Rist. And so everybody has a, a positive memory, it seems, from, from mm-hmm. the WizKids uh, production. It was a very happy set. It was a very congenial group of people. Everybody was thrilled to be working. The kids brought a special energy uh, that lightened it, and uh, and everybody was there to to do the best possible job they could. It was fantastic. I know that since then uh, you've been up to other things. I didn't know if you wanted to uh, mention your book. I I. Um, I transitioned into being a writer, and I had three books published. Um, Good for and, you. And, and the first one was called First Time Mothers, Last Chance Babies. And the second book was The Childless Revolution. Mm-hmm. And the third book was uh, a biography of the jockey Lafitte Pink Eye Jr. called uh, Anatomy of a Winner. And 
that was because uh, they approached me and, and through a family member, and that's how I got involved with that. And now I'm working on a fourth book. I taught at USC. I taught writing at USC. I went back and got a master's in writing and uh, taught for 15 years, and I just retired a couple years ago, and I'm enjoying that. So, yeah. Excellent, excellent. I want to, yeah. again, thank you very much for coming on and talking to us about WizKids. And I have it a was special, fun to go over those happy memories. If you would, I have a special request. If you could yes. give me, in your best authoritarian motherly voice, which you were so good <laughs> at, give me a Richard Adler. Richard Adler? Perfect, perfect. <laughs> I really appreciate nice you being on Forgotten you, TV today. Okay. Thank you Take so good much. Care. We've got a way of having fun here in the USA. A certain style, a certain flair that comes through every day. You've got the touch, America, and you're coming on. A touch of tears with friends you loved for years. We've got the touch, America, and we're coming on with all the best. We've got the touch, America, UNCBS, UNCBS. All right, well, today on Forgotten TV, she was the well liked teenage daughter on NBC's hit series, ALF. But her first regular TV role was on none other than 1983's Whiz Kids, which is why we're here today. Please welcome to Forgotten TV, Andrea Elson. Hello. Thank you so much for being with us today here on the show. And we're, of course, talking about 1983's Whiz Kids, which I've been steeped in research for the last several months on. And, and I, I thank you very much for coming on and talking to me today about this. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, was, was Whiz Kids your first regular TV acting job? I mean, you can only believe so much of what IMDb says. Uh, it, you know, it, it says that you, uh, you started uh, working at age 11. Tell us about how you kind of got started acting. Yeah, so I started really doing school plays and then moved into commercials. Um, I did a Target ad, um, voiceovers. And so it is true, WizKids was my first regular, regular show, regular series. How did you get involved in the production then? Um, uh, did, was there just a casting call and you showed up? Do you know if other people were already cast in, that, the, in those roles? So at the time, I was living in New York, and WizKids was set to shoot in L.A., and I had a, a manager um, in New York, and I got the call that they went through everyone in L.A. and didn't quite find what they were looking for yet, and they wanted to extend the search out uh, to New York, and so... I auditioned, I read for the part, and um, they put me on video and sent it in to the producers, and then I had a call back still in New York, and I think it was the third round when they were taking me, they flew me out to L.A., and where I went for the network uh, reading, um, and there were a few of us, there was, I believe, okay, this is a long time ago, right? <laughs> right, of course. But I believe there was someone or one or two people from L.A. auditioning for the part, and then there was me. Um, and, yeah, I ended up getting it. Fantastic. So was uh, did you see anyone else we might know? I've heard uh, a few stories already in my reaching out to a lot of people uh surrounding the show um, about names that, that were tossed around. Do you, do anything, anybody else we might know who was also uh, applying for the role? It sounds like you know more than me. <laughs> so no, I don't, I don't remember. I'd love to hear who else was up for it. <laughs> well, not for yours specifically, but some of the others, obviously they were looking at multiple uh, headshots and, and, and uh, at some point Ralph Macchio was considered for the role of Ham. Huh. But okay, yeah, course, I can see that. He was busy with a little movie while you guys were filming WizKids. Right. So, a little uh, something called Karate Kid? That's right. Yep. It uh, right? filmed the same time you guys were filming your season. So were you aware that, that the early CBS press kits that were sent out to the press and to TV stations omitted you 
in a, in picture and by mention in in those um, those press releases. Yeah, you know, I vaguely remember that. I vaguely remember there was a picture just of the boys, um, and I wasn't in it. And you know, that happened. Um, I didn't get myself wrapped up in all of that. Really, I was. I, I was so new in the business and um, didn't come from a showbiz family. For me, it was this huge adventure. And um, I was just kind of going with the flow on all of it. I, I, it was odd that they, they omitted you, um, being that you were cast in the initial four characters. You know, there was, there was no other, no other uh, kid characters on the show. What was it like being the youngest and, and the newest person to the business out of out of all of the uh the main cast so even todd and jeff they had had experience before in the in the business yeah a little bit okay uh jeff had been on other shows uh he had been on mork and mindy Uh um todd had been on a film and on local television in new jersey i believe that's right that's right i remember he did local television those those boys they were like brothers you know they were um so that's why I kind of didn't even remember that they'd done anything before because they were just excited to be there and they were so unassuming. And the three of us were sort of the newbies, you know, they, um, they were just fun to be around. We just kind of, you know, it was, it was sort of like, I don't know, they were a little bit older than me and yeah, we had a good time together. I didn't ever feel like I was the, you know, so brand new to everything. I'd been on sets before I'd done the commercials and this and that, you know, Matt, that was a different story because he was such a professional and he'd had so much experience. And um, he brought a certain, um, he kind of lifted everything up to that next level. Um, whereas, you know, at times there was immaturity with, with Jeff and, and Todd, not to say that's a bad thing, but they were what, like 15, right? 68 or something. Um, and we were just having a really good time. So I never was made to feel like, oh, you're the you're the youngest and you're the least experienced. It was just that was a part of the path. Okay, yeah, you were 14, right? When that uh, when this all started? Yes, I was. Uh, To Matt and Jeff's uh, uh, 17 year old, and then uh, Todd was 15. So they did uh, they were a little bit older than you. Um, Did you were you accepted as part of the cast? I mean, was there any kind of, were, were the boys cliquish with uh, being, you being the young girl on the set? I mean, are, were you friends with Melanie, the, the, the young actress? No, she was, she was like little sister ish to me. Actually it was Madeline Kane. She was so lovely and she and uh, my mom became friendly and I used to go over to her house and um, she was so sweet. I just absolutely loved her Um, but really I hung out with, I hung out with Todd a lot. Our moms, um, we'd get, we'd go go out to dinner together. So it was really because Todd came out from New Jersey and I went out from the, I went out from New York and we were just there with our moms. And so we definitely, I'd say of the whole cast, Todd and I spent the most time together. Well, that's interesting because early on in the show, there was like a little love interest being a storyline taking place between Ham and Alice. Um, and they later dropped this, but uh, it was two or three episodes where they kind of touched on the little, oh, you know, they're, they're going to go on a date and uh, Ham's going to ask you out and all of that. And do you have any idea why they, uh, the, the, the writers dropped that storyline? You know, maybe it's because the chemistry that Todd and I had was not a romantic chemistry at all. It was really more of like we were pals. So, you know, because they started more with Alice and, and Richie. Mm-hmm. Um, little stuff there, more on Alice's side than Richie's side, as I recall. Right. And um, I was always a little bit not, I wouldn't say I had a crush on that. I was just always um, very respectful of him. He kind of, at, he was always extremely kind, um, but a little bit removed because he was very professional and had so much experience. And so I think I was a little bit intrigued by him and, and, and him as an actor, and I really respected him. And so I think that for me, I felt so young. I was 14. You know, there wasn't like a romantic thing, but there was definitely a little bit of an intrigue because he, um, like I said, he just was a little bit removed from um, Todd and Jeff and me. 
he just kind of put himself up to a little bit different level. And he was at a different level at that time. You know, he lived there and he was driving and he was kind of, you know, all that. Huge experience. He had done a lot of work at that point. A lot of work. I really yeah. respected him. Very yeah. young age as well. Um, early on, too, there was a crossover episode with Simon and Simon. <laughs> yes. Where you had Jameson Parker come on. I guess you remember that. Oh, my gosh. I had the biggest crush on Jameson Parker. Okay. Interesting. Because they wrote that into the into the script. Well, yeah. I couldn't stop oogling. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. And then uh, Jameson was sort of like, uh, you know, AJ was uh, uh, sort of allowing it to, uh, OK, you know, I'll uh, I'll play, you know, I'll let this play out or something. But, uh, you know, and, and then it, sh- it seemed like he had interest in Richie's mom. But, of course, that never really played out again. They never had another crossover. Right. And he and Gerald McCraney were wonderful. They were so kind and so much fun to work with, both of them. Yeah, you went on their show, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, was that fun. was one, one night after the next. Wednesday night was WizKids, and Thursday night was Simon and Simon. And you could see uh, the WizKids the next night. So that was, that was pr- pretty thrilling. Yeah, it was a good time. So you had uh, you shot in a lot of cool locations. I mean, you had uh, there in Calabasas, California, was where much of the much of the shooting took place on location. Um, there was the the Canyon High School. Um, you guys filmed at a water park once. Um, do you have a favorite experience from all those location shots? Um, gosh, that's a, I mean, water park was super fun. Um, well, it's kind of funny. So I found out years later. Uh, maybe three, four, 15, maybe two or three years later when I, when WizKids was over and I was back in LA, when we were riding our bikes through Calabasas, the girl who became my best friend in high school, who still is one of my best friends in the world, um, all of these years later, she lived in Calabasas and said she used to watch us filming, watch us riding our bikes right down her street. So um, hindsight, when I look back, I think, oh, that was like my first connection with my with my, you know, best high school friend. So that sort of became, you know, what you asking me now, um, when I look back on it, that's sort of a fun location because we still talk about it. I mean, we've been friends for, you know, ever and ever now. Um, So that was kind of fun. That is neat because, you know, on the they released the show on DVD in France, but not here. And uh, with the additional clarity, you can even read the street sign um, of where that was. And so it doesn't take a whole lot of, you know, a whole lot of Googling on the maps to determine what street that was. And, uh, you know, there it is. There's the WizKids house right there. Um, And, uh, of course, the the, there was a lot of area locations, the Burger Barn. Um, Didn't you have uh, didn't you do a a, uh, fast food commercial at one point? Am I remembering that correctly? Um, or am I thinking I, of someone else? I don't. You might be thinking of someone else. I did a lot of commercials. I did um, voiceover for Florida Grapefruit. I'm trying to think. I don't believe I had a fast food commercial. One of the times when you guys were filming at the high school, um, and I don't know if you recall this, uh, Matt and Jeremy actually broke out, or Jeremy, Jeffrey, uh, actually broke out and did breakdancing on camera. And uh, that scene is cut out of a lot of uh, syndicated runs uh, that were later showed in the United States. But uh, in the uh, unedited version, you can, do, you, can, you can see that scene. Do you, ha- do you recall that? Vaguely, now that you're <laughs> mentioning it. Vaguely. And they were really breakdancing, too. That's so funny. I mean, this stuff, you have to realize, like, I haven't thought about any of this in so many years. I imagine you probably don't get asked a whole lot. Like over 30 years, 30, you know, plus years. 36 years ago. Yeah. Now, your character, Alice, was a lot of times the voice of reason and had practical suggestions compared to the way that Richie and the others wanted to do things. And she wasn't always listened to, but sometimes she was. And that was from the very first episode of the pilot when that happened. And later on we saw that she was pretty competent around the computer terminal. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the very last episode, when your character was working at the Burger Barn, um, it was called May I Take Your Order, Please? Mm-hmm. It was filmed early on in the series, but actually was held due to preemptions and so forth to the last aired episode. Um, 
and your character ended up taking things into her own hands, tracking down the people and getting kidnapped. Do you have any thoughts or uh, memories about filming that episode when you were on your own and tied up in a chair and the others were, uh, were going to come after you? Yes, that was one of the most fun episodes ever. I loved it. It was great. I mean, that one, that one, that's the one that stands out because it was like my show. I just put in air quotes, right. you know, I was able to, um, I, I still remember, I can still see the face. I can't remember his name, the actor who played the one who kidnapped me, but I saw him in something recently and I said, oh my gosh, he's the one that kidnapped me in WizKids. <laughs> and he was so nice. And um, June Lockhart, she was in that episode, I believe, right? Um, I think that was another one, but um, it was um, it was it was a different one she was in. But uh, there was definitely an episode with June Lockhart where. Okay, I remember she was really kind. Yeah, I remember the guys were wearing the Jeremy Connection T-shirts. Right, and right. You didn't you didn't get one. You were a Girl Scout cookie salesman. Oh my gosh, I <laughs> forgot about that one. <laughs> But yeah, May I Take Your Order, Please was really fun. I loved it. Just the whole, you know, part about getting kidnapped. And I remember we were shooting it at night and it was, yeah, good memories. One thing I do remember, this is really weird, but something to look at when anybody looks at the episode. Um, I remember when I was working at the Burger Barn, there's this one close up of what's supposed to be my hand on the little, you know, pushing the button of may I take your order, please. And it was so not my hand. That hand did not even like look like it belonged anywhere on my body. And I remember watching it saying, whose hand is that? So when you look at that episode and you see a hand in there, that was clearly not my hand. <laughs> yeah, that was in the uh, actually during the titles, during the opening credits, they, uh, the episode title came on right over your hand, pushing the, the speaker button. Huh. And uh, you can find that not my hand. that photo online. Well, not yeah, not your hand. Interesting. <laughs> well, you know, halfway through the show, uh, it got moved by CBS to Saturday night. I don't know how much you may may recall about this, but um, there was there was a, a change of producers. Uh, Bob Shane left the show, and other producers came on. And you what had what I perceived to be a tonal shift. To also taking place in the storylines. You had what once were these comedy mysteries um, trying to be literally the Hardy Boys with a computer, as was the original idea. Mm -hmm. um, now you had international espionage and assassinations even. Um, the Athena Society uh, showed up as, as a, an ongoing uh, element, story element for several episodes. Do you have any uh, re recollection of that or any thoughts on how that, how that all changed? You know, I sort of, I do recall when it switched to Saturday nights and everybody was saying, Oh, it's the kiss of death. It's the kiss of death. And I think that what happened was, you know, like you said, it, it, it was originally lighthearted and solving, you know, mysteries using the computers. And I think that they were trying to figure out who their audience was at that point. And on a Saturday night, if they were trying to appeal to teenagers um, with this darker sort of realm to the show, those teenagers were not going to be sitting at their TV on a Saturday night at, what, 8 o'clock. They were going to be with friends or doing whatever. Um, so I, I, I don't know why they chose to do that and why they chose to take the show in that direction. Um, I, I, I believe it was probably the network that switched it to Saturday nights because it was struggling on Wednesday nights. Right. And I don't know, it might have been then you might hear better from Bob, or although he was gone at that point, but from someone else, you might know if it was the network that dictated that there needed to be a shift in the show in order to try to save it. I think it was all like life-saving hmm. measures at that point, probably. On Wednesdays, it was a, had pretty serious competition with real people and the fall guy. Oh, right. So I, th yeah, I think a lot of the potential viewers may have been watching fall guy during that time. Hmm. And so there was there was some competition taking place. And as as we found out, you know, Saturday night wasn't the great night, uh, even though that was interestingly the original intended night for WizKids. I don't know if you were if you recall or were aware of that, but they at the last minute decided on Wednesdays instead, which was a better night. It's interesting to me to think back on, OK, if it was originally supposed to be a Saturday night show, I wonder if they had premiered it on a Saturday night and kept it geared more towards the younger audience who would be home on a Saturday night, you know, they're not out at parties or whatever. It might have had a better chance of survival rather than trying to move it and shift it and revamp it. And 
Bob tells us that the original intent was to air on Sunday night against 60 Minutes as a juvenile alternative to uh, CBS's uh, news show. So uh, the fact that CBS themselves picked the show up, that changed the whole intent of the original concept of the show. And isn't that interesting because years later when I was doing ALF, we were up against 60 Minutes. And as I recall, we were the first show to ever beat them in the ratings. Interesting how that all comes back. <laughs> right? Do, do you recall then how you got the news that the show had been canceled? I don't. I really do not remember at all. I know I was back in New York at the time, and I honestly have no recollection of how I found out. Okay. So you just you just went through all the produced, uh, all the ordered episodes, and filming ended, and mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't until actually the first week of May that they announced it, although I think by February it was pretty clear what their intent was because it, it kept getting preempted week after week for other right. things. You were just as likely to see, see Dukes of Hazard or an animated special instead of WizKids. Yeah, and I sort of feel like maybe as I'm thinking back on it, I, I'm sort of feeling that maybe Phil Daguerre gave me a call and let me know that it wasn't happening anymore. That sort of kind of just popped into my mind. And he was such a, a nice guy. I could see him doing that. But I'm, I, I sort of uh, am under the belief that perhaps he, he gave, gave us all a call to let us know that it was done. He was se- definitely somebody that was ahead of his time as far as uh, the average person knowing about computers. Um, For I've sure. Read, yeah, I've read uh, interviews with him in uh, old PC magazines and things where it shows that he, was, he wrote software. Um, he actually wrote a database. Uh, during a writer strike, so I mean, he mm. wasn't ignorant with uh, regarding these things, and he managed to get on uh, the Gavilan Company and Apple and Heathkit and and all of these different companies to provide uh, equipment for the show in exchange for uh, uh, f- for their brands being shown on air. So it was a fairly uh, he was a fairly forward thinking individual. Mm-hmm. Do you recall? Um, before the, the show went to uh, film for the series, um, during the summer, there was a little movie that was released called War Games. Yep. And uh, Matthew Broderick, and uh, uh, the, uh, directed by John Badham, it was released in June. And a lot of people will falsely, uh, you know, there's this idea that WizKids was a ripoff of War Games. Of course, you know, right. it was long in production, long before War right. Games was released. Um, CBS even announcing it well before the release of the movie. But did you see War Games before you guys went to go film for the series? I saw War Games. I mean, we shot the pilot um, of WizKids before mm-hmm. War Games was released, if I recall. Because That's everybody, right. when they were saying, oh, they ripped off you know, War Games, we were all saying, no, we shot the pilot before it was even released. And so I believe we shot the pilot and then War Games came out and I did see it when it came out. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of jaw dropping, like, oh, my gosh. OK, here we go. We're like right on in there. We were thinking like, wow, we're right on in there with the times. You know, I thought it was perfect timing because War Games was such a hit. The country kind of went uh, War Games crazy for a little bit. Yeah. Um, President Reagan was talking about it. Um, you had uh, the in the press, you had all of these uh, news uh news instances of, of real life, uh, computer hackers in the news. It seemed like every day for, uh, several weeks late that summer. And it was right around when the show premiered for, uh, on, on TV on that October 5th, that all this actually was taking place and and it was all the news every night. So WizKids was very newsworthy at the time. And I, I don't know if it hurt or it, if it helped the show. Um, I think that could be argued either either way there. Yeah, I, it could be argued either way, for sure. I don't know. I mean, I feel like it seems like it would have been perfect timing for that show. And I think that we just didn't quite find the right niche. And, you know, like we had just talked about, part of it was that they weren't committed you know, to how the series first began and that changed and the day changed. It, it's always hard. As soon as a show changes days, times, it's sort of like they're, you know, trying to salvage something. Um, and it just, it didn't find its, it didn't find its home. It didn't find its, its audience. We only really did what, 14 episodes. Yeah. 18. Mm-hmm. Oh, we did 18. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, a little short. A, a lot of a lot of seasons did a lot of TV shows did twenty four episodes back then. Twenty two, twenty four, right. twenty six episodes, um, and you you did what would almost be a full season order. So after Wiz Kids, you went from being on unfortunately what was in the ratings a bottom five show with virtually no reruns to a top twenty show on NBC uh, on Alf that was heavily rerun. Mm-hmm. I remember. Well, that was, they ended up stripping that for every, every weekday for years mm-hmm. was, did you feel that was a, I mean, that was a monumental change for you with, uh, going from, uh, you know, a little, a little show that got canceled to this hit that was on for four years. And it seemed like it was on for a lot longer than that because of all the reruns. What did you think about that? Were you ready for the fame of being on a hit show? So, you know, it was like a whole new experience, just like WizKids, um, was my first, experience doing an, uh, um, an episodic television. Um, ALF was a whole just new experience. And again, just going with the flow on it. We didn't shoot it. So Wiz Kids, we shot at Universal Studios. And there was that element of, oh, the trams going by and click, click, everyone taking pictures. And, you know, there was that. And then we went I went from that working on a big studio lot and seeing all the other shows and all the other actors and everything. And that was really exciting to shooting ALF, which was this huge show in a teeny tiny industrial park where Wonder Years was sort of down at the other end of the park. We never saw any of them. And so we were sort of isolated. Like I think it would have been a whole different experience if it had been ALF shooting at Universal Studios. That would have been like... But because WizKids never really took off, but there was the experience of, of working in a big um, studio, and then there was the like hugeness of ALF in this teeny tiny area, I wasn't in that sort of element of running with the celebrity crowd. You know, I was at that age, my parents said, okay. if, you, if you're great, I went to a college prep high school, and it was if your grades drop. Um, You start getting into drugs. If you start becoming a brat, you're not, we're pulling you. You're not doing this. And so I had pretty strict guidelines on, um, on, you know, life and I enjoyed doing it, but it was part of it was just, it was a job. And um, yeah, there was the, the element of, I got recognized and that was always a little bit weird for me. It was always a little bit strange and a little bit uncomfortable at times when, you know, I'd be like in a public restroom at a concert, like really. Um, (laughs) But, you know, I was always super flattered and super grateful that people were watching the show and that they liked my work and um, that they had a good time with it. And those were some long days I've read on your ALF filming. They were some long days. Because there were so many technical things that, that were technical aspects to the show that just weren't, wouldn't have been the case otherwise because of all of the uh, the visual uh, uh, setups that had to happen with uh, the puppetry and everything. Right. I mean, we couldn't film in front of a live audience, obviously, right. and the sound stage was built. Uh, the um, the sets were built up, so we had uh, what do you call it? Like um, it was dangerous. There were it was built up with these big holes in the floor where you know they'd walk, um, so Alf could be at our our level basically trenches. Sorry. I just had a total brain brain okay. cramp. Um, there were trenches. And I remember one time, Annie Shadeen, who played my mom, she walked in through the kitchen and they forgot to cover the trench and she went down. And luckily she was awesome and landed on her feet, but that could have been a really treacherous experience. And they were very long days, lots of technicalities and lots of, Oh, I see an arm. I see a head. I, you know, <laughs> it was, it was crazy, but it was, it was an experience, that's for sure. Wow. Well, I, we certainly enjoyed you on, on both WizKids and ALF and, Thank you. and your other shows that you were on. And, and of course, you eventually, like, like many, ended up leaving the industry and to pursue other things. You want to tell us uh, what, what you've been up to since then? Sure. Yeah, I was sort of, once I had my daughter, um, she's now 22, and I was working on a show. I was working on Young and the Restless, actually, when I just had her. And I realized that when I couldn't hold her and I couldn't kiss her, you know, in case what she spit up on my wardrobe or I messed up my makeup or something, I, I, I got home from work and I thought, you know, this is not why I had a baby. This is not, not what I want to do with my life anymore. And I wanted a private life for the sake of my, my kid too. I didn't want 
to put this innocent little being like out there in the limelight when I just wanted her to have a quiet, happy, sweet um, life. And so um, I actually had been already pretty deep into a yoga practice at that point. And that's something from before, way before I had her, years before I had her, um, I discovered yoga. Well, my sister, my, my sister at the time, she was like, I cannot believe you haven't done yoga yet. And she introduced me to it and it changed my world during stressful times when I was, you know, working or feeling, you know, oh, rejection. If I was auditioning for a part and I didn't get it or you're too this or you're too that and insecurities would kick in and anxiety, whatever. Yoga gave me an opportunity to just let all of that go and for me to realize that I am who I am and I, um, I really like who I am, um, regardless of external feedback from anyone else in a business that I was kind of getting frustrated with to begin with. So I dove deep, deep, deep into my yoga practice. And then years later, I decided to become a certified yoga teacher. And then I opened up a studio and then I opened up another one and I now lead teacher trainings and I lead international retreats and I, I, I teach. I love it. I love it. Um, I truly try to live my yoga. You know, a lot of people think that yoga is just the exercise, but there's a lot more to it. There's a, there's a lot to it. Just living a really um, intention based life, being kind to myself and others and kind of, as I've mentioned, sort of as a thread through this interview, really going with the flow. So that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. It sounds like you found your niche and, and you're enjoying life with your family. and For sure. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about uh, an obscure television show from the mid-80s. It's uh, <laughs> It was a fun trip down memory lane. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's, it's enjoyable. Uh, hopefully with uh, things like uh, the new NBC Universal streaming service, Peacock, and uh, or... Uh, a studio might uh, choose to to license the show. We might yet see Wiz Kids in the United States on streaming or DVD. One, you know, we can we can always hope for uh, for a release uh, and get to revisit Wiz Kids uh, again and again. I love it. Be fun. So I really appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, thank you very much for being on Forgotten TV. You're welcome, Chris. Thanks for reaching out. Next Monday, he's Scarecrow. Hi. She's Mrs. King. What? He's a spy in trouble. It's a matter of life and death. Life and death? She's not your ordinary mother of two. I want that package. Good, I don't. I'll come to your house. You certainly will not. Together, they're partners undercover. Right hand on the snake, left hand down on the throttle. Why? We're flying. Kate Jackson and Bruce Boxleitner tackle international espionage as Scarecrow and Mrs. King, premiering next Monday. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. So today on Forgotten TV, he had his own series, made his feature film debut, and was a voice actor all by age 12, before being cast in the role of 15-year-old Hamilton Parker. I'd like to welcome to Forgotten TV original whiz kid, Todd Porter. Uh, thank you, Chris. How are you? Uh, just fine. Thank you so much for being on Forgotten TV, and we're finally able to get in touch and, and uh, get, some, uh, get some discussion on this 1983 series that uh, many people our age fondly remember as uh, an early depiction of uh, interest in computers. I mean, it was a groundbreaking yeah. show. Um, but before we start to talk about WizKids, just a little bit about yourself. I mean, I introduced you that uh, you had those those credentials going into uh, uh, being cast on the show. How did how did you get started in all this? How did you get into acting? Well, way back when I was around eight years old, between seven and eight, my mother, um, I, I, I expressed interest in music and uh, singing and, um, and uh, instruments. And uh, I took up the piano and I started training as a classical pianist at the age of seven. Um, and taking voice lessons to sing. So that kind of blossomed into um, thinking about commercials, modeling. Um, I don't know that I was uh, fit to be a model, but <laughs> at that point, my mother made a decision to kind of pursue that with me. My father, um, prior to me doing any of this, was an actor himself. My father uh, graduated the Academy of Dramatic Arts uh, with Florence Henderson in New York City years and years ago. My mom and dad met 
uh, teaching ballroom dancing in Newark, New Jersey, where my mother grew up. And my father uh, grew up in East Orange, New Jersey, where he was, believe it or not, a police officer for a short period of time before starting his own business. But prior to all of that, he was an actor. And uh, he was Captain Video's Ranger in the comic book series, where he was the sidekick, sort of like the Robin to Batman. And um, okay. he was, uh, you, you, can, you can Google Bruce Porter, he's there. Uh, you'll find him in Captain Video's Ranger. So my dad had headshots, he did all this type of work. So he basically became my acting coach. And uh, I started doing television commercials. I have about 40 or 50 of them under my belt for various products and uh, services. And uh, that blossomed into uh, initially me having an agent, the Bonnie Kidd Agency out of New York. Uh, they, she, Bonnie Kidd was her name. She actually headed up the agency and did a majority of my commercial work. Then I grew sort of out of that agency and went into a manager, a managerial uh, situation where I go through multiple agents. <clears throat> her name was Selma Rubin. Her agency is still in business in uh, Queens, New York. Uh, outside of a commercial acting, that's how I started doing my um, TV shows like Star Stuff that you had mentioned on the website. Uh, I did a movie with Burl Eyes called Earthbound. Uh, I was Pinocchio in Pinocchio's Christmas, mm -hmm. which is a Rankin and Best special that airs every year still on to this day. Um, and that, that's something I'm really proud of because that touches the lives of many kids. And I really like that because as a kid growing up, I used to watch Rudolph, you know, the year without a Santa Claus, the Bumble, you know, all those, all those great things in Christmas spirit. So uh, I'm still watching that. And my nieces and nephews watch that growing up. It's, it's kind of cool to be a part of something like that. And then I landed with kids. Um, with kids was uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, and I became very close with Phil DeGuerre and his daughter, Adrian, who was on the show. Uh, Adrian and I still speak today. Phil has passed, of course, um, unfortunately. Uh, Phil had me over his house many, many times when my mom, because my mom lived in California with me when I shot with kids. She sacrificed a lot. My mom and dad were separated for, from each other for, for months at a time. My dad would come out and visit in between construction projects because that's what he wound up doing, construction. And he would come out and visit. And uh, I would spend two to four hours a night on the phone back in the 80s, which you know what that might have cost. Uh, reading my lines to my father and reviewing my, uh, my, my next day's work that they would give you the day before with any changes in scripts, things like that. Cause he was truly my coach. Um, and then, uh, we started to evolve and get into more training for body positioning, speech, that type of thing as the series continued on. So that kind of brought you up to speed to the whiz kids. Wow. Yeah. That's uh that's quite a story. Yeah. You were doing a lot of that. It, uh, right around the same time. Um, right around 1980, uh, yeah. where you had the voice I was actually competing for... classical piano. I was actually competing nationally. You know, there's, there's a certain flair to classical piano that caters to, um, technical hand movements and things like that, that I, and I still play piano today. My mother, I used to practice three hours a day before and do the commercial work when I was with Bonnie Kidd back in the early stages. I used to have a, a grand piano in my basement and I would come home from school go right down into the basement, and it was a two- to three-hour practice session. And I loved it. I mean, I just loved playing classical music. Uh, you know, I've kind of fallen out of its grace because you need to keep current with that. I could certainly take it back up, but it would take a lot of time to get back to where I was with the nimble fingers of an eight-year-old. <laughs> but um, it, was, uh, it was a truly great experience to learn piano, and as a result of that, I became a drummer. And on one of the episodes in WizKids, and in the opening, you see that I play the drums. That really was me. Um, yeah. so it was, it was kind of fun to have that musical background and sing too. Yeah. You played the drums a, a couple of times on the series yeah. uh, and sang yes. once. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that was you, right? Yeah, it was me. And the funny story is my brother, Frank, who's my oldest brother, um, is a songwriter and one of his songs that it played on the show, they, uh, the universal studios actually bought one of his songs. So it was kind of neat, you know, for him to have his song air on the TV. Yeah. So you got you guys started filming this in January of eighty three, uh, the original pilot. Okay. And what uh, did you, do you have any recollections of of filming that pilot? I mean, that was that was the uh, the, the first time you were all four together. Um, it hadn't yet been picked up by a network, so um, you guys looked really happy on the bikes coming down the hill. You know, kind of kind of weird. I was a bike rider as a kid. I had a BMX style bike, you know, and that was kind of the bike that we rode, we all rode on. So that was kind of neat to do that. It was in like all kinds of different areas of California and especially with uh, Richie's home there that uh, I see somebody visited. I saw a photo, I think on your website of somebody standing out front of the home. Uh, it's kind of neat to see that. It brings a lot of memories back. So the bike riding was fun, but I got to tell you, one of the best things that I've experienced was the graveyard scene. 
Um, I'll never forget that because it was dry ice that they used to create that fog. And uh, we had a bunch of crew there that was uh, helping, you know, jumping in and out of that hole and, and, and setting everything up in the graveyard with the shovels when we hit the coffin. I remember that vividly. Um, I remember one of the stagehands actually jumped down into the, the site to fix something and cut his hand really bad, winding up going to the hospital, getting stitches. So that, that kind of like set that, that whole scene there, it was so realistic, that graveyard scene that they created on the soundstage. It was really incredible. So that's something that sticks with me. Oh, that was on a soundstage. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was created in one of the lots on the Universal lot. That was done well enough to where, you know, it looked like it could have been on location. Yeah, they made it look like that. It was actually on a soundstage. They, they did a great job with that. They really did. You walked into that soundstage and you thought you were in a graveyard in the middle of the night. It was, it was crazy. Yeah, that was uh, that was really effective. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, I mean, you guys were all in the same age range, but you were 15 years old. Yes. Um, the same age as your character, and you were really the only uh, one of the original kids that was the, the same age as the character age was supposed to be, freshman in high school. What was that like being on a weekly network TV show at 15 years old? I'll tell you what, it was it was kind of crazy for me. I was never one to like the spotlight. I mean, even though I was an actor and I, I was very, I'm very outgoing, but I didn't like, I didn't need the accolades or the praise from anyone. So it became very weird to me. My dad, I remember one time my dad came out I had had a, a trainer. I was starting to uh, get into a little bit of weightlifting, and I had a, a gym that I used to go to. My mom had me signed up to. So I had a personal trainer, and uh, when I was out there, my dad came to visit once, and we needed to go to the mall to buy something. I forget what it was. It was a piece of clothing, or we were just going shopping. So we went to this big mall out there. I want to say, I, I, I recall Calabasas, maybe. I'm not sure if that's where it was, but... We went to this mall, and all of a sudden, my father, who has previous experience in acting, says, hey, take a look behind you. There's a line of people following us through the mall. And I, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're actually, they actually want to meet me. I was like, I cannot believe this. So it became very, uh, very strange for me. I embraced it. I, anytime I had an opportunity to do something for somebody, I did it. You know, I just did. I, I believe athletes, actors, people of fame have a, a, a responsibility to give back to the people that give them praise or follow them or, you know, because you're nothing without those people, you know? So it's my belief. And I, I hate to see these athletes or these famous people shy away from a little kid that wants an autograph or, or, or maybe just a picture. You know, I know, I know it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a pain sometimes because it's inconvenient, but you know what? You got to do it. And that's how I felt. You know, I tried to do the best I could. And at the very limited stage I was, I mean, I'm certainly not some big A-lister, you know what I mean? It was just the least, but, but the least kids were mm -hmm. hit pretty big back then. So it was kind of nice. It was a good experience. And not only did you have, uh, you know, experience the, uh, the notoriety of, of being on a show, you still had to go to school yeah. during the day, as opposed to maybe the older boys, uh, you and Andrea certainly, uh, also had, you had the restriction of being able to only work what, four hours a day on filming and then having to attend classes. Yeah. We kind of cheated on that a little bit outside of the workload. Oh. <laughs> they, they didn't follow the letter of the law back then. I'm sure it's much stricter today than it was then. But um, we had a, a school trailer, which had desks in it, chalkboard, and we had a, t a teacher. I was lucky enough to not have to transfer to California schools. My school back in Cedar Grove, New Jersey, was called uh, Memorial High School. Um, all, my three older brothers went there. My family grew up in Cedar Grove. I walked to school every day. It was backyard to backyard to school, that type of thing. Very safe neighborhood. So my, my school actually agreed to send my workload out, FedEx it out. And I would do the assignments and FedEx it back to be graded. So they worked with me long distance like that. And I had a tutor that would sit in the trailer with me and, and go over the assignments and I would do the homework and that type of thing. Okay. Interesting. So what was your experience working with other teenagers? How did you get along with your co-stars? We got along very well. I became very close with Jeff JK. Um, I actually reached out to him recently. I believe he's an attorney now. I see he's on, um, Facebook. And I, I think he's doing very well for himself, but we, we actually exchanged text messages. Um, Jeff and I became like kind of like pals running buddies. You know, we used to walk the soundstage a lot, you know, and, uh, you know, go to lunch, that type of thing. We always went to lunch with, uh, the facts of life girls cause they filmed right across from us. So Kim Fields, you know, those, those girls would all walk together yeah. to go to the cafeteria for you to have lunch. And, um, Jeff and I just kind of hung out and kind of clicked. Andrea and I were very close. Um, we used to laugh and joke a lot together. 
Um, Matt, uh, Matt and I were very, very good friends too. Matt got along with everybody. Uh, just like me, Matt's mom was on set quite a bit. So it was nice to have a parent there, you know, on the sidelines watching, you know, it's a lot of sacrifice though. As she was actually in one of the episodes. Yeah. Yeah, she was. Absolutely. And, uh, it was, it was just a nice kind of family thing. You know, whenever we went on site, I remember filming at Canyon Country High School. That was a little bit of a challenge because school was in session. But uh, we had the trailers where we had our dressing rooms. And, you know, it was like one, two, three, four dressing rooms right next to each other. It was like going in and out of somebody's mm-hmm. home, having having some food. And it was just a, like, like a nice family environment, you know. Now, I know on uh, location at the Canyon High School, Matt got asked out by one of the students. <laughs> yeah. And he actually went on a date. He actually went to the dance with one of the students, regular students at the high school. And I was wondering if you ever had any experience like that. I did. I did. I had a, uh, I had a girl. I want to say, I recall her name being Christy or Kristen and she would follow me. Um, there was no Facebook back then. There were no cell phones. So it wasn't, you know, it was, it, I don't even think there sure. were beepers yet. <laughs> so it was like, it was, it was like, uh, when we were on site there, she would follow back to my trailer. You know, my mother was very, very protective of me. My mother wouldn't let me out of her sight for 10 seconds. Um, she was very aware, even back in the eighties of predators, people that had ill will. And, you know, even though it's more prevalent today and more, uh, out, out in the open that people watch their kids back then it's, it was not as out in the, the media, you know? So we, right. I, I just remember getting aggravated with my mother sometimes saying, why are you so controlling with me? But now today, all these years later, I know why, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was, my, my mom was a very sharp cookie and she, she stuck by my side through thick and thin. So there really was no opportunity for me to go date anybody, <laughs> uh, no opportunity for me to go to any dance. God forbid I asked my mother to go to a dance. That would never happen. <laughs> so I know Andrea relates that she was sort of pals with you yeah. being of a similar age versus the older boys. Mm-hmm. Um, and early on in the series, there was this, uh, storyline, uh, where there was a Ham and Alice love interest, and mm-hmm. uh, Ham asked Alice out on a date. They were going to go to the midnight movie. Um, Ham was going to get his brother's car, um, and that was carried through about two or three episodes from the pilot to the first few episodes, but that storyline was just dropped. Um, do you have a, a take on why they dropped the, the Ham and Alice romance uh, that was going on? Yeah, I want to say, you know what? One thing that you jogged my memory on was the changing of the uh, directors. Uh, I had actually forgotten mm-hmm. about that. I remember now you kind of jogged my memory of feeling a sense of um, emptiness when they did change. Uh, you know, I, I remember that now. I don't remember the, all of the circumstances. We were kind of kept in the dark. We were just kids, so they're not going to tell us anything. But I remember saying, gosh, where are we going to go now? So I wonder if the new director, and I'm just taking a stab in the dark here, just saw a different vision, a different direction. Uh, and decided to take that element out of the series. I'm not sure if that's it, but that's the only thing I can come up with because it wasn't told to me specifically anything else. Yeah. Somewhere around episode nine, uh, which was the last episode Bob Shane was involved in producing, um, there was an effort that uh, I got some comments that there was a, a directive, and I don't know if it, this was network or studio, that the uh, and, and – possibly as a result of being on a regular primetime night as opposed to the original intended Sunday evening opposite 60 Minutes, uh, which would have been a much earlier time slot. Uh, there was an effort to widen the audience appeal to to engage older viewers right. as opposed to the original target age. And so this, the series had a, had a change in tone, you know, right around episode 9, 10, where they, they had that really serious episode where Richie has a near breakdown. Uh, yep. with the the war games type episode in episode 10. Um, so yeah, the, you may be, you may be right with the, the change in series direction. Yeah. I, I think war games played a big role negatively towards us because uh, uh, it, there was, I, I don't, I don't know all the reasons, you know, Phil, <clears throat> one thing I'll tell you about Phil DeGuerre, I, I considered him like a second father to me. He mentored me. We would go for rides up and down the Pacific coast highway in his car, um, he had a couple different cars two both that I loved very much. He had a Jaguar that I absolutely adored, but he had a Porsche 911, um, 928 S. It was just gorgeous. Champagne gold. I'll never forget it. The smell inside of that car. I still can smell it today. It's so vivid in my mind. And we would talk, we would just go for rides and talk. And 
he he just kind of took me under his wing, and I have so much respect for that man and and love for him. And uh, even his daughter Adrian, just a wonderful person. And hopefully, you get to talk with her too because she's got so much to say about it as well. But um, I don't. He kept me in the dark about the Bob Shane change. We love Bob. Um, I remember mm-hmm. Bob very well, and he, he didn't really give us any reasoning. Um, other than maybe it was artistic um, direction change, and they went with a different person. That, that, it, was, it was a shock to all of us. I remember that. Yeah, so you, you touched on this. War Games released uh, in between when uh, you, you filmed the pilot, and it was picked up by CBS in uh, the first you know, network upfronts in May. And then in June, this movie comes out. By mid-June, it, it is in wide release in a thousand theaters and the country goes a little war games crazy for a little while. Yep. Um, and then you guys pick up and film the actual series. Did you see the movie prior to, to filming the actual episodes? Um, I can't answer that. Honestly, I want to say yes, I did because it was, um, it was kind of like, wow, we're doing the same thing. So I wanted to see what that mm-hmm. was all about. Um, not for any reason to take anything from it, just because. Uh, and also, I mean, listen, it was a great movie. <laughs> you know, I, I, oh, I, yes, I enjoyed absolutely. that a lot because, you know, back in the Cold War days, you know, Russia's the big bad wolf back when, I, when I'm in high school, you know. And, and I, honestly, I mean, all of us, my, all of my friends always kept talking about is what if we go to war? Or, if, you know, they, God forbid, everybody's afraid of that. You know, not saying they aren't today, but back then, you just didn't know. And uh, I think that movie kind of got everybody uh, on edge about that, you know. Yeah, you had Star Wars initiative in the news, uh, the SDI program. Reagan was on. He, uh, as you pointed out, he interrupted and preempted one of the episodes. Yes, he did. Uh, what what, what would have been episode three um, got preempted by by news coverage of uh, of the president. I'll tell you a funny story. Yeah. At eighteen, at uh, at sixteen years old, I joined the Cedar Grove Ambulance and Rescue Squad as a volunteer to be on the rescue truck uh, because that that was sort of gearing me up for my next career, which was police officer. We can get into that after. But um, when I was sitting in the rescue squad building with all of my friends, because I had just come back from California, waiting for that episode to air, all of a sudden, preempted. <laughs> and I remember the, the balloons, like the air out of the balloon, it just, it just kind of went. So we, we never caught traction because we always had something that kind of stuck a, a, a fly in the ointment, so to speak, for us. It was r- rare for there to be three consecutive weeks of Whiz Kids. Yep. I agree. Because of a preemption for this, a preemption for that, holiday specials, move to Saturday, whatever the case. Yes, I know. So it was difficult, I agree. Yeah, and the the movie War Games was actually name-dropped in the first episode, I believe you guys filmed, with Robbie Rist, the chip off the old block. Yep, I remember him. And... that was that was Phil's Mia culpa, he said, episode with all the criticism that uh, was in the press and from even from the affiliate stations about the the concepts depicted in the pilot, which were entirely new things at the time. It was a- amazing that War Games and this show came along in the same year uh, that reflected what was really going on with uh, as we as it turned out with uh, kids in home computers at the time. Mm-hmm. I remember, um, I remember a couple of things that were kind of neat to experience. First and foremost, I remember going to a clothing warehouse where I was sent to by the studio to get a line of clothing, pick what I wanted out of this big warehouse, you know, a bunch of clothes, and they were all name brand, Nike, this, that, and if I wore them on the show, obviously, then I was, I was promoting that product. So, I, I mean, I just got closets full of stuff, you know, to, to wear on the show. Even though they picked our wardrobe, they did allow us to wear certain things if we wanted to, or even off, off campus, if we were just conducting our life and Bop Magazine, Tiger Beat, whatever, was taking pictures of us out somewhere, and I had a Nike swoosh on my chest, they would, you know, not for compensation, just for clothing. You know, we weren't sponsored like the athletes are. So I remember that very well. That was, that was exciting to, to have that happen. You know, yeah, you guys had a feature in Bop Magazine in the fall of that year, right as the show was was coming on the air. Yes, yep, that was Meet the Whiz Kids or something like that. <laughs> yeah, they they came to the house. We lived, my, uh, we lived on. Uh, I never, I remember the street, Barham Boulevard. Uh, my mom and I alone in a townhome that they uh, provided for us, and it was in a gated community. Um, they came to the house, so I had a keyboard there. I had a. Um, you know, I, I had the place set up for, you know, obviously to study my lines, study my, my music. And, um, they came and did a photo shoot right in the house. So it's kind of neat. We also had our cockatoo there, which is my, uh, my mom's favorite. That was, uh, a white cockatoo sulfur crested. 
So that led to, uh, not immediately, but toward the end of the series run, actually you were featured in a number of these similar magazines. You, I think you were in 16 Magazine and uh, a couple of others. What was that about? How, how did, did that just come out of the, uh, the Bop Magazine appearance? Or You know, I remember a woman, her name I think was Julie Lawfer. Um, don't ask me why I remember that name, but she was the one that kind of orchestrated the Bop Magazine interview. Once I got that and that photo shoot was done, it just kind of all fell in line. They all came. It was, it was, it was almost as if they saw it and they said, Oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. So it was, uh, it was pretty interesting that it wasn't solicited by me or, or the, the studio. It was just, uh, my manager was contacted. Hey, Tiger beat wants to do an interview. Hey, 16 of the, this magazine wants to do an interview. So we never said no because it's press. You know, so we uh, we made sure that we did them all, and um, it just kind of fell one after the other, like a domino effect. Yeah, not only the teen magazines, but WizKids was featured in, I want to say, a dozen, 16, 18 magazine articles at the time, uh, over over the course of 83, 84, which I, I have tracked down and, and read all of. Um and uh, I mean, you you guys were pictured in everything from Inter Magazine to Computer World to PC Magazine, and you, I'm sure you didn't even know uh, all of the the magazines you ended up being in. Uh, but Phil was was interviewed quite a bit by the press. I tell you, I never I never realized any of that. I mean, I would love to see that stuff if you have that to, to email over to me because that's that's interesting to me. Because they never told us any of that. They didn't tell us where they were pushing the the, the the show. You know, it was just done automatically. I remember one time we got onto a small little uh, I want to call it a puddle jumper flight from California to Arizona, and I remember getting off the plane in Arizona and the first time ever feeling that 110 degree dry heat. <laughs> which was crazy. We wound up going into this really posh hotel, which was almost like a ranch style hotel. There wasn't a second floor. It was very long and wide. And we went into one of these ballrooms where we did a whole interview. We had a press conference. And I remember that. Uh, and then I remember leaving there and my manager had set up an appearance for me at a local church, not too far from there where there was a piano recital. And I went and sat and watched these kids play piano and, uh, it was just, uh, it was, in, I was more interested in that than I was the press release. <laughs> well, that seems like a, a favorite memory. What, did you have a favorite episode that uh, any of these, uh, these different plots that Ham was involved with? Uh, uh, it tends, I, I imagine uh, most of the, your co-stars have a specific memory of, of an episode. I don't know. You, you got to drive the car a couple of times. That was pretty neat. Um, and you were the <laughs> chauffeur and ended up being the chauffeur of the group in the later on. <laughs> I know. I know. That was pretty funny. Those were, there, there were a lot of funny times. There were a lot of things I don't recall because it's been so long, but there were there's certain things I do recall. My dad had um, a favorite episode. It was Amen to Amen Ray, I believe. Yes. And and there was a terracotta statue of a Buddha. That's, so that, that statue wound up, because uh, my dad liked that so much, they gave him that statue. So he took it, but now my mom and dad has passed 2006 and 2007, so... When they, when he, he passed, I, I looked for the statue to try and, you know, to bring it home to me and I couldn't find it. It was gone. I don't know where it went, uh, what happened to it. And, uh, unfortunately, but I remember him having that. He, he, that was his pride and joy because he loved that. But on the other side, there was, uh, the, the Sufi project. Yes. With the dolphin. So the Sufi project, the Sufi project was one of my favorites, not for any reason show wise, my dad and I decided to purchase when I got back, I purchased my first car, which was a 1995 Corvette, and it was red. And my dad and I went to the dealership, and I let him drive it home. I'll never forget that. And we went to a local dealership in Little Falls, New Jersey, where he knew the owner. It was a Chevy dealership. So we bought that, and I was nervous. I didn't want to drive the car. So I let my dad drive my brand-new car home, which was great. You know, So we got home, and then my dad always wanted to buy a boat. So we decided we were going to buy a Hydrosport. Uh, about 20 foot long with um, an outboard motor just for, for bass fishing. He liked going fishing. So we bought this boat and then my dad said, you know what I want to do? And I said, no, what do you want to do? He said, I want to name the license plate on your car, Sufi one. And then I want to name the plate on the trailer of the boat, Sufi two. And then I want to put Sufi on the side of the boat. Cause my dad was an artist. So he painted and did gold leaf on the side of the boat. So the boat was named Sufi and since, since that time, I created my email at AOL, which also had Sufi in it, <laughs> which 
which, you know, Sufi stuck with me forever. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the final three episodes. Um, and I come to find out after CBS and uh, told the production that the show was canceled. Right. They still had an order. Universal still had an order for three more episodes. And that was the final three that you guys produced after uh, Craig Buck came on to write and uh, do script supervision on that on those last three episodes. Um, so the series had already been canceled when you guys were filming the Sufi project. Right. Yep. I remember that. So we did a whole big push to try and save the show. We, uh, I remember that we did a, a plea with a, you know, a, really a, a, a sign, a, like we, we sent out note of notification flyers, that type of thing. You know, we, we put, we did our, our due diligence on trying to save it or at least get an extension of another, you know, s- such and such amount of episodes. But it was to no avail. Yeah, it seems like it was a victim of of, a, of several things. Uh, had to compete in regular prime time against uh, very established shows. Uh, hits on Wednesday night like Real People. Yeah, and The Fall Guy. And I think a lot of your potential audience was watching Fall Guy. Um, and then, of course, when they moved it to Saturdays, that's a really that's a really hard night. And they follow it with a movie. That was a completely uh, a different uh, audience and a different tonal shift. A- and CBS on uh, on Saturday night ended up preempting it for this and that. Every holiday animated special that there was, the show was preempted for uh, because it was the the lead. Yeah, we just kept getting beat over the head. <laughs> yeah, the, it was the top. It was the the head or the lead in show for prime time. The audience couldn't find you. You know, you weren't on for for several weeks at a time, and then the, and then you moved. So my own experience, I lost track of the show halfway through the season, um, and uh, I didn't watch the the last half of the the series until ten years ago when I found them online. Mm. Yeah, it was it was very difficult for uh, for the audience to uh, locate you pre DVR and all of uh, you know that that type of era where where you could find the shows that you want to watch when you guys were filming on location. Uh, there was one episode that had that featured Matt and Jeffrey breakdancing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you recall this or were even present because I know you had different uh, shooting schedules than the older boys. Um, and they, they were breakdancing and it seemed like a completely, it seemed like a time padding thing in the original episode and, and it was cut from syndication. So the, the later reruns did not feature this, this scene, but you can find it with the magic of YouTube. I don't know if you recall this at all. Um, I, I recall it vaguely. I remember breakdancing the eighties were the eighties and you know, everybody knows about the, anybody that was in the eighties remembers the eighties. <laughs> so parachute pants, big hair, you know, the, the whole nine yards, but breakdancing was prevalent. I mean, it was big. And I remember my mother, hired a dance instructor to come to, to the town home that we lived in and he and he brought a piece of linoleum rolled up in a roll like a carpet roll and he unraveled it in my living room and he taught me break dancing so very very limited i mean i wasn't good at it i, I to this day couldn't even try but the funny thing about it is, is that i uh i remember it was so big you know to, to learn how to break dance and uh i do remember that vaguely in the episode that they did that and jeff I, i'll tell you matt, matt like me shared the same uh, kind of awkwardness with the break dance, but I remember Jeff. Jeff, boy, he really could do it. He was very good at it. <laughs> he was very animated in life. You know, Jeff was very, very animated. He was a a fun guy to be around. A fun uh, uh, back then, a kid to be around. I mean, we were we were just a we we were the one two punch. You know, we loved we loved what we did, and we kind of hung out together. Jeff's mom was phenomenal. They had a house in La Jolla. I remember that. I never had, I've never been to it, but I remember her being just a wonderful lady. I'm, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't know if he, she's still with us. I'm not sure, but you know, she was just wonderful. She got along very well with my mom. Yeah. Did you? So after the show, did did you remain friends with Jeff and the others? The limited time. We stayed friends until it became hard to stay friends because remember back then, yeah, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have. Skype. We didn't have FaceTime. We didn't have cell phones, you know, like that, like they are now, you know, so it, it, it just became, it became a, a little bit of a hassle because everybody's got their thing going on. You know, life goes on, you know, you had to write a letter. Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah, we kind of lost touch after the first few, first few months, you're still gung ho to stay in touch. But then after that, 
it kind of became mm-hmm. a little bit of a, uh, hey, listen, I got to do my thing. And you just kind of move in a different direction. So where, where do you think the character of Ham would be today? Huh. Uh, I know that uh, in following a lot of the uh, this original uh, real life uh, whiz kids, some of them lost interest in computers and went into other fields. Um, what, what do you think Ham would have turned out as a career? Um, Ham was designed to be athletic in nature. I was actually told, and this is why I had the gym with the personal trainer, that they wanted me to become le- less skinny, more bulky, um, you know, meaning physically fit, you know, and, and, and look like an athletic type. I don't know if you recall the soccer, you know, and, and all the sports scenes. But, um, yeah, I think, I think Ham would have wound up being a blue-collar kind of guy, um, probably become a dad that's very protective of his daughters. Um, but Ham... I, I, I tried to make ham and I, I was, I, I, it's hard for me to say this cause I was, I was young, but my dad had taught me, try to make this character you. So that was part of his training with his acting. And, and, and by saying that it was, what did I want to do with my life back then? Well, my brother was a star quarterback in the high school team. He was back in Cedar Grove, New Jersey. He wore the number 12. That's my favorite number. Love Joe Namath. Um, and Terry Bradshaw of the Pittsburgh Steelers is one of my favorite quarterbacks and he wore the number 12. So everything with me is 12. Uh, so I think Ham would have wound up becoming a coach of a team, um, something to do with athletics and very protective of his family and uh, very protective of whatever kids he may have had. But I think he would have still tried to win over Andrea because <laughs> I'm a Taurus. And if I'm going to make Ham my own, <laughs> they're stubborn and they're very, very, very determined. <laughs> so that's probably what would have happened. <laughs> That's great. You know, you had uh, your character did wear or you wore uh, a, a letter style jacket in some of the episodes, uh, you know, high school style letter jacket. Yep. I don't recall it actually having a letter on it, uh, but it was it was one of those styles. And, and there, like you said, there were uh, several scenes that showed you guys playing basketball and while Richie was over reading a book on programming or something. And um, yeah, there I, it, it did successfully depict uh, your character as, as uh, being athletic. Right. Since the show ended, I mean, it's been 35 plus years. If you wish to go into what, what do you ended up doing after the show? I mean, you touched on a couple of those things uh, earlier. Well, the last thing I did, I was on Kate and Alley in New York city. I'd come back and I'd film that in Manhattan. Um, that was the last thing that I, that I did as an actor. Um, I mean, I, I don't have any problem telling you about why we kind of left the acting field what happened was when I came back to New York City, uh, my dad is a very, was a very driven man, very disciplined man, um, a, a great father, uh, a workaholic, kind of like how I am today, um, great provider for his family, a great husband to my mom, um, and a true leader. I mean, we respected our dad, the four boys in the house. And my dad always pushed me to be better. So when I came back from California, I was a little upset about WizKids ending. I did the Kate and Alley. Oh, okay. um, show i had interviewed for a couple of parts um uh that i just missed i interviewed for the champ which ricky schroeder wound up getting um i interviewed for um a couple of different movies and then i wound up doing the kate and alley episode and then i started taking um speech and movement classes in new york city uh i was in an acting class with jane krakowski from alley mcbeal i don't know if you recall and um, we, we, my mom and I were going in and out of the city quite a bit and trying to sculpt myself to, to move to the next level. So one day I come home and in a house in Cedar Grove, New Jersey, and my dad and I are going over some things. And my father just kind of looked at me and he said he didn't believe I was committed or serious to what I was doing. And I, I got upset as a teenager and, and acted out of, at that. And I kind of regret it today because I think I let him down. But he kind of struck me the right way. And as being a 17 year old boy or, you know, the, the attitude that you have back then, I said, you know what, I'm going to quit acting and I'm, you know what I'm going to do that. I'm going to do what you did. I'm going to become a cop. <laughs> so that that's what prompted me to take the police test in Cedar Grove, New Jersey, which I came out number two, they only hired one. And then I went to a township uh, in Fairfield, New Jersey, where uh, I came out number one and wound up becoming hired as a police officer. And that was my career for the next 20 years. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. A silly little spat with my dad caused me to make that decision. Uh, And uh, that's that's how it went. (laughs) That's quite a quite a bit of a different life from uh, from acting and being on screen. Yeah. Yeah, it it is. And you know what? I enjoyed my time as a police officer because, again, I was helping people. I wound up being a narcotics detective my last seven years. Um, 
I retired and uh, it, it was, I got hired at 18 years old as a police officer, which I feel is too young, but back then it was, you know, okay, here I am. And I made a career out of it. And now um, I've decided uh, I couldn't sit still after I retired in 2008. So I took on a, uh, a role as a salesperson for a car dealership uh, selling Nissan, a friend of mine's owned the dealership. Uh, I learned the business from them, um, but then I had an opportunity to become a sales manager at a Cadillac dealership, which I now I'm employed with Cadillac. And, uh, you know, it, it was a, it was an easy transition for me to go into the sales field simply because the police career taught me how to deal with people. Mm -hmm. And I was already a people person in my young life as the actor. So it kind of transitioned into this role that I have now, which I, I enjoy my job. I work with great people and, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a good, uh, it's a good path that I've been down. I'm lucky to have what I have. Yeah. Do you, do you ever get recognized from your former life uh, as an actor? Um, once about five years ago, I was out with friends at a restaurant on a Saturday or, or a Friday or Saturday evening. And we were, w w this group of friends that I have, they like to sit at the bar and have dinner. They don't like to get a table. They like to kind of sit by the TV and, you know, just to just have some, some appetizers. So we sat on the corner of the, and it was a pretty upscale place and we we're sitting there having food and, um, you know, just, just enjoying each other's company. And someone from across the bar was, could feel this look, they're looking at you and they think you, you, you're wondering why, you know, and then they came over. It was actually a couple. And they said, can I, we ask you a question? And I said, sure. They said, were you on a TV series as a kid? Uh, and they mentioned the whiz kids. And I, I just started, I, I turned, I turned a little red and I, and I actually started laughing because my friends had no idea that I was because I didn't discuss that with them. And they're like, what, what are they talking about? And <laughs> they, wound, they wound up, I wound up having to explain to my friends the whole thing <laughs> and saying yes to these people. So it was pretty interesting. It was neat. You know, it was neat to experience that. Nice to be remembered, you know? Amazing. Yeah. And they actually name dropped the show, which, uh, which shows that they, they well remember it. Like, uh, like I found uh, c communicating with a lot of the people that were interested in the 80s and computers. Uh, I find, oh, yes. Oh, yes. I remember was kids. I, that was actually got me interested in computers and, you know, I get that. I found that at least a dozen times online with, uh, with different people. I got to applaud you because I've never seen somebody, um, do so much research and know so much. I'm, I'm so impressed with you and your, your efforts that, uh, that's what compelled me to answer you. I know we got caught in that little spam thing where you didn't get my initial email response, but I got to tell you when you first emailed me, uh, I, I would love to know how you found me first and foremost, but then when you did, I was actually excited by it because I kind of took a look into you. I did my little due diligence and I said, who is this guy and what, what is his, what is he all about? And I was so impressed with somebody that actually makes this kind of effort, which thank you. Thank you for your recognition of, of the efforts of the show. It's, it's wonderful what you do. Well, it, it's something that uh, should be shared with everyone. It may appear to be to some to be dated or uh, a primitive uh, network TV effort by today's standards, perhaps, um, but it is something that is, is in the United States, at least very difficult to, to track down. Uh, there was an overseas DVD release, uh, par for the partial season, not the, not even the full, uh, full 18 episodes, but, um, it's not something that you can find, uh, on DVD in the U S or on streaming. And so hopefully, um, with, uh, new streaming services that are coming out and so forth, Universal will bring whiz kids out of the vault and everyone will again be able to watch what was a groundbreaking show uh, before uh, 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 Phil and, and Bob went on to do other things. And so uh, uh, that that's my hope is for, for it to be released. Yeah, I think so. Phil, Phil, Phil was involved with Jag, right? J uh, the, the Jag uh, yes. series, which I thought was amazing too. That was that was a great series. He uh, he brought the his next project was the Twilight Zone oh. uh, revival in 1985 which I'm revisiting. So that was a, another amazing story. There's, uh, the, there's, there's a, a lot of, I, I come to find a lot of uh, little amazing stories uh, regarding Phil. I'm, I'm continuing to discover them. Yeah, he was quite, quite the amazing man. I tell you, you, you have no idea what he, the talent level that man had. I remember he was into, I'll give you one final thing about Phil. He was into wizardry, if you're familiar with that, with Disney. So, uh, where, you know, Mickey Mouse wears the, uh, the wizard cap. Sure. Uh-huh. So, so was so into that, that my mom and I ordered a custom satin, almost like a, mem remember the members only jackets from the eighties? Yes. 
this was like a satin, like very plush black with a, an embroidered Mickey Mouse on the back, the bigger than life, larger than life with a wizard cap on. And we, we ordered him this custom jacket. It was made by a seamstress and we gave it to him for his birthday. So I, I remember doing that because he was so into that. He loved that. And, 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 and he, he was just such an artist by, by nature. You know? Yeah. Certainly a very forward thinking man. Um, uh, he, he was interested in technology and understood it at a level that almost nobody did in 1983. It's very interesting to go back and watch that show now. Uh, and compare that to what the average level of understanding was with uh, computers and technology at that time. So, right. um, yeah, he, he was a, he was a, a very interesting uh, a person, brought us a lot of entertainment, and uh, so did you. And so I really want to thank you for, for being uh, taking the time to be with me today on Forgotten TV and talk about Wiz Kids and the other things that you were involved in. I, I really appreciate uh, uh you being on anytime my friend if you ever need anything moving forward i'm here for you you have my personal contact information and i'd be happy to help it's really uh it was really a pleasure spending a sunday talking with you thank you so much thank you for 20 years the portal has been closed it is about to be reopened this is a detour a twist in time a curve of space journey into man's imagination with america's most fantastic storytellers coming soon to cbs all new tales from the twilight zone Today on Forgotten TV, she appeared on the Wiz Kids pilot as Linda, fellow student in Mr. Zachary's computer class, and again in episode 10, The Network. More than that, though, she is the daughter of Wiz Kids co creator and executive producer, Phil DeGare. I'd like to welcome to Forgotten TV, Adrian DeGare. Thanks. Hi, Chris. Well, thank you for being on with us today here on Forgotten TV, talking about this over 35-year-old television show and, and some other memories, hopefully, too. You know, I've been uh, working on uh, producing this, uh, this effort, reminding everyone about WizKids, and uh, it wasn't until a rewatch of the pilot uh, somewhat recently, you know, more than a, a couple of months into my research, that I noticed this name in the credits, and I said, who is that? Who is Linda? And I had to go back and uh, see what, uh, who Linda might have been in the, in, the, uh, in the WizKids pilot. And so to jog our memories, I have that clip to help us, to, to remind us of, uh, well, let's, let's just hear what, what Linda has to say. Shirley Harrison, the Sunnydale Hospital? Uh, Mr. Zachary? Uh, yes, it's Richie. Uh, what is it, Linda? Uh, nothing, sir. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, uh, Linda was a student in the uh, Mr. Zachary's computer class in WizKids, and uh, presumably on, on an ongoing basis. So we saw a, a similar character, or po- perhaps the same character later on. But uh, that introduced me to, to the, the fact that uh, there was someone named Adrian Daguerre, and we got in touch through Todd Porter. So it, it was uh, a, a, a happy coincidence that, uh, that we came to, to, get, to be in touch, and, and I'm glad to talk to you today about, uh, about all of this. Great. So what was it like growing up with uh, a TV producer and writer as a father? I mean, he did other things, prov- uh, obviously, prior to WizKids. There was the Doctor Strange TV movie, which was fantastic. There was the, the he worked on the Baba Black Sheep original series. And, of course, Simon and Simon. So uh, tell us about what it was like to grow up in a household where, you know, your family was involved in making television. Well, it was very exciting, and and that certainly led to my desire at the time of wanting to also perform and act, and that's what that's what led me to be on the shows because I was trying to um, break into that as well. Um, I don't recall ever being on a set before Doctor Strange. I may have gone to Baba Black Sheep, but I don't recall. So um, Doctor Strange, I was probably about eight or so, and I do remember that pretty vividly because 
you know, it was fantasy and sci-fi and there was, you know, cool effects, at least for that time. And I remember just being very wowed and, and uh, overcome by just the magic of it all. Mm-hmm. And um, and thinking it was like wow this is really cool, <laughs> and my stepmom at the time Linda was an actress as well, so it was very much like this is what you know my my family does, and I think I want to do it too. And that was a very seventies TV movie. I mean, um, yeah. I like it. Uh, and it, at the time, it was uh, uh, Stan Lee is quoted as saying that uh, it was one of the the best. TV adaptations of his Marvel characters, um, oh, cool. and uh, you know, I think it was just a uh, unfortunate we didn't get an ongoing series. Uh, I don't know if people were ready for the heavy fantasy element in 1978 um, that we got with that. But uh, Jessica Walter was great in that. Peter mm-hmm. Hooten, um, and I, I have it on DVD. They did a very good job uh, remastering it and uh, putting it out on DVD to obviously. Uh, with the the recent Doctor Strange film, but uh, yeah, that was that was a great one. And uh, of course, Baba Black Sheep. You would have been very young uh, when all of this was going on, like you said, uh, six, yeah. seven, eight years old. And later on, then of course, he was involved with Simon and Simon more more than involved. I mean, he created the show. Right, and I remember that really vividly because it was such a prominent thing in his life, and it was something we talked about at home a lot and I remember when he did the pilot um, Pirate's Key in Florida and then then the plot line switched it to San Diego and um, my stepmom Linda was you know friends with um, some of the wives and you know there was kind of hanging out with with people from the show and parties and, and things like that neat yeah that that show became a hit in the second season um, of course, anybody that's listened to the, the podcasts uh, uh, on the WizKids will have heard a little bit about the history of Simon and Simon and how that uh, in the second season that, be- that became a hit for CBS. And it sort of led to the, uh, the clout of being able to create yet another show for CBS and uh, CBS picking up WizKids. Yeah, yeah. How did you get involved in, in getting I mean, I mean, you were first. You appeared on Simon and Simon. You were on one of the episodes. Yeah, I did. I mean, I I think when I was about six or seven, I realized I wanted to do that, and it was because of um, the Electric Company. <laughs> if you remember that show, sure, I uh, yeah. was watching that show and was like, I want to do this. And so I, my mom said, Well, you know, talk to your dad, obviously. And he, as I recall, didn't really believe in acting lessons per se, but he said I should be doing other lessons. So I was doing ballet and tap and singing lessons, and I did some little local theater thing in Santa Monica. And I'd been doing that for a few years. And so when I was 11 is when he said, okay, I'm going to give you a little speaking part on Simon and Simon. And so that's what led to that. And I remember it being absolutely terrifying. Um, (laughs) But Linda was there supporting me, and, and my dad was there. And I got through it, and I was okay. And so, you know, we kind of continued on this track of my dad would kind of give me these little bit parts. And then when he was creating Wiz Kids, he actually had me audition for um, Andrea Elson's part, Alice. And I don't think there was really any intention that I would have gotten that part. Um, I wasn't seasoned or even necessarily talented enough for it, but he was kind of prepping me for what the audition process was like. And so by the time shooting was going on for the pilot, I was really invested in it. Of course, it was about kids, so it was much more interesting to me, per se, than a show about adults. Linda had been cast as the, the principal, so it was very much... Um, a family thing. And so for the period of time that that was in production, it was a huge portion of of my life and our life. Was this a a part that was uh, written in for for you to to have a couple of lines on? Or was that uh, something that was in the original script? Do you remember? I think both of the the you know little speaking parts I had on those two different episodes were already in there, and I think it was more my dad was just kind of looking to see you know where he could slot me in um, versus something really being written for me. 
Yeah, that's what I remember. Okay, because you do have a little bit, you, quite a bit more in uh, the beginning of episode 10, The Network. Yeah. Uh, where you, you have, uh, it's, it's uh, your character is someone for Richie to talk to and for there to be some exposition going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was a little bit more going on. I mean, you were front and center on, on screen as well, as instead of the, the pilot where you were sort of running around the right. running around the classroom. What is this message, you know? So what do you uh, were you on the set a lot uh, at the on on the pilot or was it just a, a day or two? Or do you have any any recollections of what uh, what the filming was like there? And it was on location at the, at the high school, right? Right. Yeah. The pilot. Um, yeah. I remember being there, um, obviously, for the day I was shooting. I think I was even there for the very first day of shooting. I could be wrong, but I think the first day of shooting was the graveyard scene in the pilot. And I think Linda and I went down and did that. I mean, this was all in um, spring, I want to say. So, of course, I would have been in school. But then when um, the show got picked up and shooting started in earnest for the other episodes, it was summer. So I was able to um, be around much more when I wasn't, you know, kind of at summer camp or whatever it was I was doing while um, my, my parents had to work. But I remember, you know, kind of being carted out to Canyon Country, I think, is where that mm-hmm. school was. Canyon High School, yeah. Yeah, and being on set and, and just being around for all of that. And the graveyard scene yes. was on a soundstage. And that was one of, uh, Todd told me, that was one of his favorite memories, the favorite scenes of all of the uh, the different whiz kids uh, uh location shots and well what well, wasn't really on location it was on a sound stage and you could have fooled me when watching that so they were very effective in in creating that exterior appearance with the fog and right. and so forth and uh, that's a lot of fun yeah. the the pilot really really had a lot of elements that worked really well yeah i think it's still my favorite episode mine too it's uh it's it's whiz kids at its best and it, it was the original concept uh as evolved from the combination of Bob and Bob Shane and Phil DeGuerre, uh combining their ideas into the into the show that we got and unfortunately we had tinkering by the network and by uh, people that were concerned about the concepts depicted um, when they showed the series or they showed the pilot at the May upfronts to for the advertisers and for the TV affiliates CBS after that gave directives uh, to to Phil about uh, we have to have more of adult, adult supervision going on. We can't have them uh, doing illegal activities and all of these things. So he was given this list <laughs> of things that uh, mm. that they needed to change, and they tinkered with that concept. You know, the the core concept where the kids drove the story, and they were they had agency and were able to do a lot of things uh, without direct uh, adult supervision um, with the adults just showing up at the end to, to, oh, well, this is what happened, you know, uh, just showing up to, to assist a little bit. Um, but that, that was kind of lost in later episodes uh, where they had, you know, it was much more of the police being involved and, uh, you know, right. you know the, ch- yeah. the character was changed. Uh, so, I, I mean, the character of, of Gallagher was changed to that of Farley and so there was a, a much different dynamic. You know, he was an older person uh, than, than the original character we had purportedly to give additional supervision and a, a more adult guidance, I guess. Mm-hmm. And what so did, were you a watcher of the show? I mean, I, I don't know how how that uh, that might be in, in a household where it's just well, this is what we do. Um, I don't know if you were a regular watcher of your dad's shows. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so funny to reflect on what it used to be like back then with how it is now, where they shoot, you know, in most cases, they shoot an entire series and then just release it, and you can just binge it. And so it's <laughs> it seems so archaic to have this lifestyle back when, you know, you didn't go out on a whatever night your favorite show was on. Um, and so certainly, yeah, we always, it was a thing where every time Wiz Kids and Simon and Simon came on, we were at home and we were watching it and, you know, life was orchestrated around that. And my dad was also taping all the shows and I would help him with that. We would tape them on, um, actually we did Betamax for a while and then, um, we did VHS as well, which thankfully was (laughs) the way to go since Betamax didn't, didn't last. But I did want to comment on the last thing that you were saying, um, to prep for, 
this conversation, I went through and read some of my journals from back at that time. So I don't actually remember this, but I commented on it in my journal, which was after the pilot had been shot, and I guess the show had been picked up at this point, I'm not sure, but we all flew out to Phoenix at some point after the pilot was shot and before um, shooting started in the summer for the following episodes. And we were there, I guess, primarily for um, press conferences. And I was sitting in on the press conference and I made a note about my dad being grilled about, you know, these kids doing all these things like stealing their brother's car and, you know, kind of the, the influence it would have on American teenagers and American kids. And at some point, I guess he got really angry and slammed the the table with his fist because I wrote about it (laughs) in my journal. So I just thought that was an anecdote that might be interesting. That is fun. You know, there are so many of those articles. Um, I've done a lot of uh, newspaper archive research and, there were just one after the other of, of these articles uh, that were after the pilot. And they were all hitting in June and July when uh, uh, the after the writers could uh, – the, the reporters could formulate these these articles and put them out. And, you know, uh, it was uh, – I think Fred Rothenberg said uh, that uh, WizKids does not make a whimper on the sex and violence scale, yet it may be more dangerous to children than anything on television this season. Oh, my God. You know, wow, these these hyperbolic, uh, you know, headlines. Whiz kids, not good role models. <laughs> wow. Program rife with uncomfortable ideas. That was that ran in my home hometown newspaper. Wow. Um, Whiz kids, no good for youngsters. Those were the headlines. So it had negative press, and you know, some of this I think had to do with a certain movie that came out in June. After the series was picked up and announced by CBS, it was uh, uh, MGMUA released War Games on on June 3rd. Hmm. And so you had this um, somewhat similar concept going on in a movie that became very popular. It ended up being the number five movie of that year. And, uh, you know, in late June, it was playing in a thousand theaters. So you had uh, reporters questioning uh, Phil about uh, some of the concepts and how it compared to, to the, co- the concepts and, and, and things depicted in war games. Um, did you see, you remember recalling uh, uh, seeing war games that summer? I'm sure I did. It was about kind of nuclear stuff with Russia. Is that right? Right. Um, the young character yeah. David Lightman, played by Matthew Broderick, uh, dialed in with his uh, computer modem to uh, various computers, which you know was depicted on the sh- on the show as kids as well. Mm-hmm. And he ended up dialing into uh, the NORAD National Defense computer system, which had an AI that triggered uh, a war game, but to the computer there was no difference between reality and and the game. So. Right. Right. You know, it, it freaked President Reagan out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not surprised there. <laughs> so that was, you know, that was it, the nation kind of went war games crazy a little bit. Um, you had uh, it was uh, a topic on, on different shows. And then you had the real life uh, imitators uh, where it, it turned out, you know, there were uh, real life whiz kids that were. Do war, doing war dialing, as it came to be called, and, and dialing into different computers and getting themselves into a little bit of trouble. And uh, all, of these, all of these news stories kept uh, escalating as it got to August, September, and you know, coming close to the October premiere. Um, and you had all these things happening at about the same time. So uh, it was interesting how 1983 was just this nexus of, of all these uh, – this awareness of home computers and what was going on with uh, – Teenagers uh, getting involved, uh, you know, being interested in computers. Right. Yeah. What? To, so, I mean, the the press was was unnecessarily harsh. I think to uh, to your dad and to the the production. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't recall a lot of conversation about war games, but you know, it could have been just out, outside of my earshot. It was, he was probably talking about it at, at the studio for sure. Yeah. He actually had to dr- to draft a position statement. For the show, which he pulled out when uh, because he got questioned by so many different reporters about uh, what was going on. And uh, I, I dug this out of an old magazine 
And uh, even uh, Bob Shane wasn't uh, wasn't aware that Phil had this written statement that uh, he could give to the press about, uh, you know, we, the producers of WizKids, are fully aware of our responsibility, you know, and, and sort of a disclaimer uh, of sorts. And it, it, it's it's a fictional show. It's not, you know, as was brought out by uh, Bob very, uh, very correctly, we don't have that same uh, analysis and criticism of when Simon and Simon go do different things that are sketchy or, you know, to, to – aid in their investigations mm. there's not that same criticism of uh you know a, an adult detective sh- series or or whatever the case may be um but if it depicts children then uh all of a sudden we're taking all of this literally as if it's not entertainment right you know and it, i just felt it was uh, unnecessarily harsh mm-hmm. yep i don't know if you had uh additional thoughts about what what about the direction of the series you know when you appeared on episode 10. That was right after Bob Shane left as, as producer of the first half of the show. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, it was uh, handed over to a new producer. And we had sort of a, a change in direction or uh, uh, thematic thematically uh, of the story and how that uh, the stories became much more serious. There was uh, an effort to uh, sort of widen the appeal to older viewers, um, older than the original core uh, uh, target viewer. Um, and uh, you had, you know, Richie, and it was basically episode 10 was heavily influenced by war games. I mean, there's no question uh, that that was what was going on. But, uh, and I don't know how much you may recall about that specific episode, but that, that series direction really changed. I don't remember if you, you realized that when you were watching the show. Well, you know, the problem is is that some of the episodes I just don't remember as well. Um, like I said, my dad taped everything. Um, I think when I left for college, I actually pilfered the two tapes of the shows I was in. <laughs> so I actually own those now. And um, my dad's widow and, and, uh, and my current stepmother, she must have the rest. So I've gone onto YouTube to see old episodes, but they're not all there, at least, you know, the last time I checked. Right. So I haven't, you know, I haven't been able to refresh my memory on a lot of the episodes. I do kind of recall just kind of thinking, well, you know, I don't know, these aren't as funny and um, compelling as, let's say, the pilot. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I think I liked the drama. I thought, you know, the network was um, was really... Um, compelling and interesting and and really grabbed your attention. And I remember Alice, you know, having lots of dramatic scenes and crying. And I I thought all that was great. But then there were some episodes which just kind of didn't really grab me anymore. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. Yeah, it it just seems like the direction was different from the original concept, which was the Hardy Boys with a computer. Yeah, Um, yeah. And and young, you know, the original age of what the Hardy Boys were, were supposed to be. Um, or even younger. I mean, they were freshmen in high school, so you're talking about 15-year-olds. Um, and the idea, I think, was that the, uh, the as the characters aged, the stories could also mature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even as they went through high school, you know, pie in the sky, the series went on, you know, five or six years. Uh, they would go to high school, they would go to college. And so there was a, a definite uh, intent on casting teenagers so that uh, those those the actors could age with the characters mm. and you could see them uh, uh, mature and uh, and you know they're visibly were older in the later half of the show than in the pilot um, and and we we would have this uh, this progression of uh, of storyline where uh, maybe the stories would get more uh, more adult in nature as uh, as they aged sure. But uh, there was definitely this, uh, you know, it was it was sort of a it began as a, a fun, uh, sort of almost a whimsical adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Bob calls them comedy mysteries, and so uh, the you know we, then you had episode ten where Richie has a near breakdown with uh, the realization of what uh, what was going on. Yeah. So, and you're right that it's uh, it it is difficult to find all of the episodes. Uh, they're not necessarily all there i made a playlist uh that i can send you that uh has the 
all the ones that I can locate. And, uh, you know, that's, that is something that is, uh, is unfortunate that it's so difficult to, uh, to locate episodes of the show. Mm-hmm. What about the, the productions, uh, afterwards? You know, we know that, uh, after Wiz Kids ended, uh, Phil's next project was, was reinventing the Twilight Zone for CBS. Yeah. In 1985. Yeah, that was a cool time, for sure. And I didn't, I wasn't really going to the sets anymore at that point. Um, I had decided, you know, acting was really not for me. I didn't really have the the stamina and the ambition to endure the um, audition process. <laughs> so I kind of shifted gears. But, you know, again, it was, you know, my dad coming home and, and talking about work. He was so excited about Twilight Zone and all of the collaboration that was involved in, um, you know, getting members of the Grateful Dead to do the, um, you know, the opening melody for the, for the theme or, yeah. And I, I specifically remember it was so cool to see, you know, kind of headline actors being cast as, um, you know, little parts in the episodes like Bruce Willis and, and different people. And, um, the big episode that sticks out in my mind is um, Nightcrawlers. He was he was so into that and um, had his favorite director was it William Friedkin I think um, shoot that I hope I'm getting that right but I remember that was a big deal I may have even gone to the set for that because he was so focused on that and that was kind of his um, his big effort um, from a real creative standpoint. That was the one that was so violent. Yes. Where uh, they had the, uh, it was a, a drifter that showed up at a diner, and he had some type of mystical yeah. or mysterious powers, and uh, you know so many of these stories are you know out in a rural highway with, <laughs> in this little out of the way place, a little little motel or a little diner somewhere, and uh, I remember my dad commenting on that. I think I missed that. Uh, when that first aired, I was working at the movie theater and probably worked that night and missed that episode. I mean, he told me there was an episode that was so just ridiculously over the top with how uh, <laughs> how much uh, uh, explosions and uh, people attacking with machine guns and all of this. Uh, you know, he's telling me it would it would have been rated PG-13 if this had been on a movie. And uh, here it was on television. And, yeah. you know, I'm revisiting uh, the, the show on DVD and uh, your dad has commentary on several of those episodes. Mm-hmm. And I know he ran into trouble with uh, the, the time slot that uh, the show was intended for, which was intended for much later in the evening. Right. And what we ended up getting, which was the first show in prime time on Friday night when uh, younger viewers were, were you know, t- tuning in as well as the parents. So uh, there, was, there was sort of this, uh, what is the, the tone of the show supposed to be? And, you know, they had already yeah. written and started producing all of these episodes. And, uh, you know, it was, it was tonally off. For what eight p.m. Uh, being the first show of the night, and so yeah, that uh, Nightcrawlers was uh, was a, definitely one of the most intense uh, segments of of the Twilight Zone or or of of, of any series. <laughs> really, it was uh, <laughs> yeah. that was a lot. Yeah, and you know, I don't think he was so much into the violence of it, but he really loved. Um, I don't know, just fear, you know. And I can recall him telling me at times throughout the years, you know, kind of the, the human, um, love, hate relationship with being scared, you know, and, and feeling that, you know, having that visceral experience and, and yeah, what's so great about Nightcrawlers is it's the, the story's about a Vietnam vet who, you know, had some kind of interaction with a chemical of some kind that, that, yeah, gave him these uncontrollable powers where when he would fall asleep, he would start dreaming about being in Nam, and it would come to life, and that's that's what happens in yeah. the show. Yeah, that was uh, that was intense. Yeah, William Friedkin, um, and of course he got he brought on Wes Craven to direct episodes. He got Harlan Ellison, which was you know an accomplishment, um, and uh, even down to to bringing on George R. R. Martin. Uh, to write yeah. episodes, and uh, that started that kickstarted George's uh, Hollywood career, and out mm-hmm. of which came uh, eventually Game of Thrones. Right. Reading yep. about there, there's lot, uh, there's all these interesting stories about uh, about your dad, and uh, 
the different people he worked with and um, his his different interests. He was definitely uh, understood technology in the early 80s at a level uh, that was highly unusual. Mm-hmm. He, he understood how computers worked. He, he wrote a, a database during a, a writer's strike once. Um, so he knew how to write and program software. Um, he did the, uh, he put together the, the system that allowed the network to actually track scripts in production, which was adopted. What I'm reading would, was adopted by the whole television industry. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, his, uh, he was very forward thinking individual. Um, and, uh, I've, I've found a lot of articles and quotes about, uh, about his, uh, his thoughts on different subjects and, um, uh, you know, he was the one that went out and got all of these uh, computer companies to have their equipment shown on WizKids in exchange mm-hmm. for, you know, promotional consideration and for the brand being uh, being displayed on screen. You know, mm-hmm. that was uh, that was at a time before uh, we really were aware of product placement and things like that. Uh, right. I mean, that was a super early instance of that. And, uh, you know, he tried to even get uh, IBM involved in, in sending uh, equipment. And there's a whole story, which uh, I have on the show, about uh, why IBM computers were not uh, cooperating with WizKids. And uh, <laughs> so, but he did get, you know, Radio Shack and, and Gavilan and these. Uh, and so you saw the, the, the early, early laptops and uh these different computer components. And a lot of this was real. A lot of it was really what was happening on screen. It wasn't an effect. I mean, uh, you know, some of it was, was software that was off the shelf and you could purchase. And, um, it was, uh, it was pretty incredible. You know, after the twilight zone, he was involved in another series. They brought him on to adapt Max Headroom into uh, a TV pilot for ABC and then and then later of course a very short series that uh, that came out of that right yeah yeah I recall that a little bit briefly and then um, kind of my memory was refreshed a bit because um, you know I live in Santa Fe New Mexico and that's where George R. R. Martin lives as well and he bought a local uh, movie theater that had kind of gone out of business called the Jean Cocteau and he revived it and he'll just show you know the movies that are playing at the time but he'll also do kind of more um, idiosyncratic cool eclectic things and a couple of years ago I want to say he did a feature on Max Hedrum where he showed the the UK version and then he played um, the pilot that was that my dad was involved with and that George was involved with and so a friend of mine um, you know, told me this was coming up. And so I went and I took my son and, um, we got to meet George and, um, it was just really neat. The thing about my dad was that he just, he was so brilliant and so charismatic and so generous and his ability to impact people, even when they've only met him once or twice, was just kind of unparalleled. I mean, he's been gone now for 15 years, and if I run into somebody who knew him, it's it's the response I get is so completely beyond just kind of a a kind gesture about oh, you know, your your loved one was a sweet person or something like that. I mean, he really made an impact on people, and so I took my son into the Jean Cocteau, and there's George just sitting there hanging out, and I introduced myself, and it turned out that he and I had met, and I'd forgotten about it, but when I told him I was Phil Daguerre's daughter, you know, the, his eyes just bulged, and he got up and shaking my hand, and then, you know, brought some other people out that had come out for this event that had been involved with the show, and it was the same response you know, when my dad's name was mentioned. And then we sat down to watch this, um, you know, watch the the screening of these shows. But first, George, and, you know, forgive me because I don't remember who the other person was, um, that he did a a kind of conversation with um, in front of the audience before the show. And there was all these mentions of my dad. And, you know, it wasn't for my benefit. They didn't know I was coming or that I was even there. But, um yeah, so I, I kind of learned more about Max Hedrum in retrospect as they talked about it, and and uh, I guess my dad's whole 
thing of he he didn't want to be involved with it for very long because he kind of knew it was a dead end with American audiences, um, something kind of to that effect. He was only going to be involved for a short period of time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Other other people took over for the very short second season they had. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he was, uh, you know, initially only for the pilot. Well, I'm only going to do the pilot, but ended up do, uh, producing and running the, the, the first several episodes, uh, the, the very, very short season that they had there on ABC. Yeah, and it could have been the same story of he just knew what the, the problems he was going to run into with the storyline with, you know, with the networks and with the studio. Yeah, and did run into. I mean, they were uh, on, they were telling him, "What? Why is you told me to adapt this pilot for ABC, and this is what we're doing?" Do you, and and it's almost they like they deconstructed the UK uh, short film and uh, presented it as as a, an, an an American interpretation, and that that's one of the criticisms is that oh, it's so similar. That's what they directed him to do. <laughs> was to uh, adapt that into a, an American show, um, you know, with certain certain little changes and things. Uh, but, uh, you know, he was criticized for that, and uh, he always went back, this is how they did it in the original film. Right. You know, and, uh, and George Martin is, is definitely involved, it looks like, in a lot of things there in Santa Fe. I mean, he... Mm -hmm. uh, involved in that, uh, that movie theater, and he has a bookstore. Yep. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I didn't realize he had moved back to, to Santa Fe because I know the story was he originally, w or he lived there and moved to Hollywood uh, to be on Twilight Zone mm -hmm. and then the subsequent things that he worked on. So that is, that is great to have, uh, have those stories and have him involved locally in those things. Yeah, he's a really important uh, community supporter here in Santa Fe, definite local celebrity. You know, it's 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 sad that uh, most of and most of Phil's shows are available. Mm. Um, you know, we can watch Simon and Simon. Maybe not every season. You know, on instant uh, on demand, uh, but uh, the DVDs are certainly there. Um, the Twilight Zone is available. Um, the the other shows, who's Doctor Strange? You know, a, a seventy eight TV movie is available and in, in great uh, <laughs> presented very well. Um, but unfortunately, in the United States, we don't have Whiz Kids in, on any ever any type of official release. It was very very briefly rerun uh, in the summer of uh, I think eighty five eighty six in a couple markets in the United States. Oh, wow. And of course it was shown a lot more overseas. I mean, it's, it's very well known internationally more than in, in the United States. In France, uh, it was run twice and had a, a following. The, I, I, actually, uh, there's a, a French uh, fan blog for WizKids that I was able to find. And so in um, a few years ago, they released some of the series on DVD in France. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, I ordered it and got it shipped. Uh, it's only uh, 13 episodes because it's, it was only the episodes that aired in France and that they had a French language track of. Mm. So the other five were just omitted. I don't, and the story of that is probably long gone. I've tried to find out why, but, uh, you know, 13 episodes was it once upon a time that was considered half a season. So it's maybe they just bought 13 or whatever the story was. Right. But uh, there's a question of uh, and, and whether or not uh, Universal Television even has tapes of WizKids anymore. I mean, uh, uh, you would think out of all the things that have, have been dug out of uh, the vaults and, and shown that uh, we would have gotten WizKids in, in one way or another by now. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really sad we don't have that. I mean, what... Uh, you know, out of all all of the things we we don't have, uh, this is uh, this is about just about the only thing that we uh, we can't uh, legitimately obtain in the U.S. Yeah, it's a bummer. But uh, you know, he he definitely left left us a legacy of entertainment. One of the things that uh, I had talked with uh, with Linda about was that um, you know he had a philosophy of you know being aware of the influence of television and entertainment on the viewer and that he always wanted to instill a positive message and leave people um, feeling better than before, before they tuned in. And so, 
You know, I think that that is something we don't have a lot of these days. So much entertainment today is either cynical or it is um, perhaps highlighting the negative uh, aspects of humanity. Mm-hmm. But we don't have, and, and some may criticize older shows as being simplistic or, well, that's unrealistic. That's not the way things are. But um, re- when revisiting the show, I really come to enjoy the older, the older shows and how that you can sit down and watch a single episode and it's a self-contained story and you don't have to know the entire backstory of a lot of characters to to appreciate it. And, you know, it it, it airs and it, it, it runs and it's over and you enjoyed it. And we're sort of missing that today. Uh, there's a lot of more complex, great stories being told. I mean, I love Stranger Things. Um, there is a, a, a sort of a resurgence of 80s uh, nostalgia uh, going on or, or continuing. I think it's been going on for a while. And you can tell great, uh, more complex stories that way. Uh, but there's something to be said about, uh, you know, the old shows that, uh, that had easier to perhaps digest plots um, that uh, you can just turn on and enjoy. Uh, I think that he gave us a, a lot of entertainment that, um, you know, we can turn on and, and, uh, and relive on DVD or, or uh, on any other of the... Uh, methods that uh, we have uh, TV content today. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it was just, you know, it was a really special time in in our lives, and um, I would love to see the show be, you know, released in some fashion in its its entirety. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I think so. I think that's, that's my goal with all of this. I really would like to get Universal Television... And uh, we have the we're going to have the new Peacock streaming service this year, which uh, is going to draw from not only NBC's library, but also Universal's library of content. So there is a sliver of uh, of a possibility there that they will bring some of the older things out of the vault and uh, and put them make them available. If if not on disc, then at least on on a way that's uh, on demand that people can watch. Um, So there's that hope. And um, uh, maybe we can get uh, some uh, emails going to some uh, some people that would uh, have some type of influence and uh, and get that show uh, found and pulled out of the Universal Television Vault. That would be great. Well, I would like to thank you for coming on and, and telling us your story and uh, uh, being with us here and adding uh, yet another perspective of um, the production of WizKids. You know, that uh, I... I very, very much appreciate uh, you coming on and, and letting us know and, the, and what it was like with, uh, with your dad and uh, how that uh, he gave us all the, those other things that we can enjoy just that, that aren't whiz kids related. So thank you very, very much for being with us here today on Forgotten TV. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I hope all WizKids fans have enjoyed these podcasts and hearing from the WizKids actors have brought you some entertainment in the uncertain times in which we now live. Many of us, including myself, have experienced the loss of income due to the pandemic and the funds provided by listener support are more useful than ever. Thanks to those who support the show on Patreon, which you can do for as little as a dollar a month, as well as those who choose to use PayPal instead. Also, listeners that send me DVDs or needed items from the Amazon wish list are greatly appreciated. These supporters include executive producers Doc Pinko and Will Welton, producers Eric Fusco, Ron, Rich Kunkel, Mark Hadley, and Julio Capa, associate producers Marley Kennedy, Chris Walker, Walnut Grovecast, Jeff Andrews, Kenny Siegel, Tyson Bowler, Collecting Trek, the OSI Files, Greg Blanchard, K.L. Young, and production assistants, David Almeida, Jeannie Schneider, John Morton, Jordan Rumsey, Dwayne Kenyon, Eddie Coulter, and Martin. And special thanks to those that send DVDs, such as Kenneth Taylor, Greg Blanchard, Eric Fusco, Doc Pinko, and Lee Goldberg. And of course, thanks to Bob Shane, Madeline Kane, Andrea Elson, Todd Porter, and Adrian DeGuerre. Let's now take a look at what's planned for upcoming episodes of Forgotten TV.
I'm James Hunter. Just when I first fell in love and everything was fine, my family had to move to Boston from a small town in Oregon. I was 15 years old and I had to start a whole new life. Travel through time to help history along. Give it a push where it's needed. Delos, builders of Westworld, must stop Quaid. Assigned is Security Chief John Moore and Special Agent Pam Williams. Let's face it, John, it's your wits against Quaid's machines. I didn't ask for this. I was a test driver. I liked the job. One day the doctor told me I had some kind of special blood. I don't understand it. But I know this. Everything they're offering, I don't want. I gotta live free. Podcasts on James at 15, Search, Angie, V, the series, Voyagers, and other time travel shows of the 1980s, Street Hawk, The Immortal, Auto Man, and Beyond Westworld. Some of these episodes will even feature a visit with actors and show creators. Because current circumstances may impact their availability, I can't guarantee the order these will be presented in. 2020 has taught us nothing is concrete, but stay tuned to Forgotten TV. As long as I am able to produce it, this podcast will be here. Forgotten TV is not affiliated with or authorized by CBS, Universal Television, Elephant Films, NBC Universal, or any production company or network involved in the making of any TV show, film, or streaming service mentioned in this podcast. Links to Amazon are affiliate. All mentioned series and associated characters are the property of the respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended. Audio clips are included for the purposes of review, commentary, and criticism only, and are not intended to infringe. This podcast is copyright 2020 Forgotten TV Media. The views and opinions expressed by guests are their own, and may not reflect the opinion of Forgotten TV Media, its sponsors, or patrons. This podcast is intended for entertainment purposes only. Information presented is based on a combination of first-hand personal accounts, period news media, and website articles. All reasonable effort has been made to fact-check the information presented. However, Forgotten TV Media cannot guarantee the accuracy of every detail included and makes no representations or warranties for the content in this podcast and cannot be held liable for errors or omissions. Remember to like the Forgotten TV Facebook page and to follow Forgotten TV on Twitter. All of this is linked up for you at Forgotten.tv. Until next time, this podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Chris Cooling. And this has been Forgotten TV. Forgotten TV.